Hello everyone and as you can see we've got off to a great start this afternoon and this is a live safari so if you don't tune in now and catch it in real time you'll miss out and we've already got a question through from Larry wondering what he missed out on this morning and to be honest Larry we had an incredible morning with this female leopard catching a baby diker which you can see just behind her. VM who I'm on camera with now has just done a wonderful focus pull to crisp up the fur of that diker which is thankfully dead now and she caught it with about over an hour left of the safari to go and she merely maimed it and didn't kill it and just lay nearby she's full bellied and that's why she has yet to even feed on it but thankfully now it's dead we're not too sure how long it takes for the diker to die or for her to kill it but that was quite tough to see there wasn't the only unlucky animal on juma this morning was this diker there was also an unfortunate young buffalo calf that was caught by some of the Inkahuma lioness. Finally, they've come back to visit us as well as one of the Birmingham boys. Now, I know the Birmingham boy headed east out of our property to go and find water after his buffalo breakfast. But Jamie's heading out in the hope that she's going to find those lioness somewhere in the northeastern corner of Juma around Buffalsook Waterhole. So really good prospects to see some lions. And Larry, that's what you missed out on, a leopard kill. We didn't see her actually take down the diker. She was quite far from us when she caught it. Um, but we heard the diker uh, squeal uh, and, and squeak, as dikers do. Not all the antelope will squeal and squeak when they're caught, but diker do. And she got lucky. Even though she was full-bellied, she took this opportunity, and now she doesn't have to worry about her next meal, at least for the next 12 to 24 hours. She's going to be in a very fortunate position. It is hot though, and take a closer look, you'll see she's panting quite heavily. It's about 33 degrees Celsius, which is into the 80s Fahrenheit. And the heat combined with her already full belly is causing her to pant very deeply. For those of you who may be joining for the first time, I would just like to reiterate that my name is Scott and that I'm teamed up with Viam on camera. And like I said, Jamie is out on the other vehicle with Andrew. And Larry, apologies, you did miss out on a kill, but only to a degree because we didn't see the actual takedown. And in my books, unless you get the claws sinking into the flesh, you haven't seen the kill. You've seen the aftermath of the kill. And that's what we got. But we were there when it happened. Tim, yes, the lions have arrived. And to be honest, this is probably the longest spell since I've been here that we haven't been lucky enough to see any lions. And that's because they've been elsewhere. But as we've assured you, they are going to come back and keep start spending more time on Juma. And something that we would also like to reiterate is that if you are ever planning a safari out to Juma, um, you will have a very different traversing area to what we have. The Juma guests are allowed to traverse far and wide compared to us. And that makes a huge difference in terms of what they see. They, they, they wouldn't have been struggling for lions like we have been. So it's important just to clear that up as we don't want to give anyone a false sense of what it's like out here if you do come as an actual guest. And Larry, sorry to hear you couldn't stay awake last night. It's very easy for us to lose fact of the matter that you guys are in very, very different time zones to us. And we're obviously hugely grateful for all of your late nights or early mornings or skipping work to, to join us on safari. And sometimes we just need some little reminders about what time it is where you guys are watching around the world. And Steph's just summed up the Safari Live experience very well. So thank you for sending through the, this comment, Steph. And you've mentioned that it's been a great learning curve for some of the newer Safari Live goers the last few weeks because it's been up and down and some drives will be relatively quiet and we need to be careful how, what words we use. It's never quiet. It's just varying degrees of action, I guess, or varying characters that are 
uh, involved in any of the safaris. But some of them are, are less exciting or, or more tranquil and more relaxed, more of a peruse through the wilderness. And others are more high paced, high intensity, high action, high emotion. I mean, this morning it was incredibly difficult to watch that dike struggling for so long. And it's kind of these mixed emotions, joy for Karula, joy for being in, a, in and around a kill, which happens so infrequently that we're in the right place at the right time. But then obviously the sorrow for the poor animal who's just been caught, and in this case, not put out of its misery for quite some time. But thank you, Steph, and it's a good point and a good uh, reminder for the, the new safari goes. You take the good with the bad out here and the, the quiet with the high paced, and we're getting a good mix of the, the, the two different variations and everything else in between along the way. Speaking of variations, we are going to send you across to a different view on Jamie's vehicle to hear about how her search for the Inkohuma lioness is coming along. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And I cannot believe that I missed all of the action that was happening last night, or not last night, this morning, with lions coming on for the first time in a while and Karuna catching a daker. Just to update you on my progress, I'm heading across to where the Inkahumas were last seen and a buffalo kill. So Brent has described in detail to me how to get there and where it was. And we'll be following up some of those, those lions. Let's go find out. We're still a little bit away, taking it quite. here to make sure I check the roads around it nice and carefully for tracks. Also noticed huge male leopard tracks. I wouldn't be surprised if it was also moving straight into that area. So we'll be looking for him as well. You know, as Scott was discussing, you just never know what you're going to find on your safaris. We've had a couple of incredible sightings over the last few days. But it's nice to know that the Inkumas are back once again, or at least they were back once again. And I saw some of the screenshots that you guys posted of that Birmingham male. He's looking really scary now. He's got this huge scratch across one of his eyes. It looks thoroughly intimidating. And they've become a lot better, in my opinion, better looking. They come with a bit of scars and some history to them, and you can see the stories etched on their faces from what they've experienced over the last few months. A far cry from the beautiful little boys who arrived all those months ago and made their first appearance in 2014. Thank you to me for risking my life to find you guys lions. I'll let you know how it goes, Joseph. I don't feel terribly under threat just yet. And I don't plan on doing anything terribly risky. I'd go for a little stroll. My experience with the Inkuhumas on foot is that they are up and running as soon as you, or if they spot you. So I'll go nice and carefully. More because I don't want to spook them than anything else. Brent tells me that the Birmingham male crossed into Torchwood at the end of the morning and wandered across, probably in search of water. I'm hoping that the lionesses are feeling a little bit too full and a bit too tired to go moving off straight away after it. So while I go and search the bushes for hidden tawny cats, it's pop back over to Scott and his spotted one. So I'm told a few of you are concerned as to why Karula is not feeding on this tender baby dika. And there is absolutely nothing to worry about. She caught this animal with quite a full belly. And therefore, it was an entirely opportunistic call. She stumbled upon it. Literally, it must have jumped up as she was about a meter away from it because I looked back at the highlights from this morning and it looked, looked like she just took one pounce before the little diker started squealing. 
it wasn't a long chase and she wasn't in stealth mode stalking before she just got very very lucky and flushed it from its hiding place and Diker will, especially be a young baby Diker like this, will hide and wait while their parents are away. And I found one not so long ago with some friends of mine in December who were out while we were on a bushwalk. And I literally had my camera about six inches away from this little Diker. It knew we were there, but it still remained dead still, curled up in a ball. So that's a good lesson for me to show how, str how, how strong their will will be to just actually stay still. But sadly, this diker made the crucial error of running and gave away its position to Karula. Now, because she had a full belly and still does have a full belly, she's in no rush to feed on this. She knows it'll be very easy to hoist up into a tree. And therefore, she's just enjoying relaxing amongst her spoils. Aha. Now, Andreen is interested to know how long will this kill keep for before it's too old and rotten for Karula to feed on. To put things in perspective, Andreen, it wasn't long ago, um, I think early December, that Karula caught a female impala, fully grown, and fed on it for five nights. Out of the adult female impala, she pulled a baby f uh, a fetus, and that fetus was the last thing that she fed on, on night five. And that was during very similar uh, weather conditions, very sim similar temperatures. So they're very happy for their meat to break down, as often we as humans are happy for our meat to break down because it comes more tender once it's aged and matured. So, quite some time, at least three to five days before it starts becoming an issue. I've seen leopards feeding on carcasses, riddled with maggots, as will lions. So, freshness is not something that is imperative for the big cats of Africa. Now what we can maybe do, because a lot of you weren't here for the sunrise safari, is uh, we can't do that sadly. I was going to suggest we could do a little highlight of this morning's pounce, just to give you an idea of how exactly it went down and what you may have missed out on. But sadly, the drive with all of that information has gone to Johannesburg with our boss, Graham, who was in town for a few days. Always great to have him around. Um, but sadly, we cannot play you that little highlight that I was thinking of doing. Now, I know for a fact that Karula does not have any cubs at the moment because we've got a very clear view of her nipples this morning that did not have any nursing rings or suckle marks around them. But Kathy in Tennessee is interested to know that if she did have cubs, how long would she be able to leave them for? And quite easily, 24 hours, I mean, it depends on the age of the cubs. I'm sure the first few days that they are born, they require more attention than each day that they become older. But you will be surprised at how long a leopard can actually leave its cubs for, Kathy. Kathy, and it does make sense because she needs to look after herself fundamentally first. And that is key. If she loses track of looking after herself in order to look after her cubs, that could end up in all of them dying. So leopards and lions will very often go for long periods of time without seeing their cubs if that is what needs to happen for them to get their next meal. And that's often the most important thing or the most difficult thing that any of the predators will be trying to do. It will be trying to acquire their next meal. And as stealthy and as incredible as a hunter as she is, she only succeeds about 10 to 20 percent of, of the time. So we need to understand that and also understand that she will spend hours 
sometimes even days away from cubs in order to acquire the next meal. Also, what can happen is that she can be quite far from cubs by the time she's made a kill and then have to make the decision as to whether to feed herself, then return to the cubs who may be relying entirely on milk, which they do for about three months. From three months of age, it becomes a little bit easier for a leopardess because she can make a kill, return to wherever she's left her cubs bunkered down, and then by that age, they'll be able to walk and follow her. She's not going to need to carry them back to a kill that they can actually feed on. Whereas for those first three months, she needs to feed herself as well as feed the cubs milk. And that can be a little bit more tricky. And it can also mean that she spends quite a long away from them if she hasn't had any luck hunting. So I guess it always varies on the individual leopardess and her cubs and the luck she has over that period. And sadly, I've never seen Karula raising any cubs, so I've got no prior stories of her in action. But hopefully that will change soon. We are certainly overdue. And have lots of cub credits in the bank because we have yet to have any luck so far in the year that I've been here. Good points just being raised by Gail in Rhode Island. Good to have you with us, Gail. And you've noticed that because this young diker has yet to be opened up, there's no sense of blood, is she still safe or relatively safe from other predators, lion, other leopard that will come and try and steal this from her? Of course, hyena, the mo most, most notorious of the scavengers out here. Yes, I think for now she's far safer than she would be had this kill had been open, and not only just open, but open for quite a few days. Obviously, the smell be will become stronger. So, good point, well noticed. Having said that, though, it's not uncommon for, for animals like hyena to just follow the scent of a leopard with no idea of what may be at the end of that scent trail, other than the fact that they know that leopards quite well, uh, well, quite a lot of the time, will have some meat that the hyena can try and steal. And some of you will remember seeing that with Tingana. And that was probably about a week or so ago when he was found early one morning with Brent, and a hyena came sniffing onto the scene out of nowhere. Um, it also happened a little bit later on that drive, apparently. And it's interesting because I've, I've heard some guides believe and uh, have this kind of theory that hyenas are attracted to vehicles because they know that there is often predators associated with the vehicles because that's who the safari vehicles spend the most time with. And I completely disagree with that. I don't think the hyenas uh, have pieced that puzzle together. It's more likely that it's just a hyena doing what a hyena does well, using its nose to follow a predator in order to see if it's got any food. So that's just my opinion on a theory that a lot of people do have out here. And that's just to offer the different theories and opinions that various guides will have. And you guys can make up your mind or watch over the following drives and try and work out what you think is in fact true. Because there are lots of myths and various theories that people are not too certain of who is correct just yet. Now, it's obviously a complicated decision deciding what exactly to do. Of course, we love watching leopard, but a leopard that is asleep on a hot day like this with a kill nearby and a full belly is probably not going to be hugely entertaining for the next 40 minutes or so. Um, at least. So it's a gamble, but I think it's safe for us to head off for 40 minutes, see what else is happening on Juma, and then come back. But let us know what you think. We're not going to go anywhere just yet. But VM and myself kind of discussed possibly heading off shortly and then coming back once things have cooled down and when we can find more likely action unfolding here. Now, x has just made a great observation, and as VM zooms out, you'll notice how incredibly difficult it would be to understand that there's even anything here, had we have not followed her to this area this morning. And I mean, thanks for doing this, x because we don't do it often enough. I mean, that rosetted coat of the leopard is working remarkably well to help her blend into the surroundings. And 
What's interesting is actually when we arrived on the scene here, I had been here this morning, Viem hadn't, but Viem was the first one to spot the leopard as he was yesterday morning as he relocated Karula, which some of you may remember. So thanks for that extra anger. And all of you must now remember how difficult it is to see them even when they just and that's probably at the moment no more than 12 to 14 meters away from us. So all of the drives when we can't find what we're looking for, there is our excuse in the bank. Thanks, Xranga. Okay, well, there's an interesting clue that's just been discovered by Detective Patterson, who's investigating the whereabouts of the Inkahuma lioness. Enjoy. I'm looking at all of the clues and reading the situation. I think it's safe to say that a buffalo died here this morning. I'm going to use my detective skills and say that it was killed by the Inkahuma lionesses and that I can tell from the way that the jawbone is placed that there wasn't enough food to go around. I'm of course talking absolute nonsense because I happen to know how the sighting played out this morning. But we've got a nice view of the young buffalo's teeth. You can see all of those ridged molars. Tiny little thing understand now why it was finished so quickly and already those large carcass flies with the bright red heads and the green bodies have descended and then the next few days this carcass or what's left of it will be crawling with maggots doing their own part to help break down decomposed matter and to make sure that diseases don't have time to spread is a very young buffalo. Horns just starting to come through. It must have been from some time, or a born sometime last year. Just spotted a leg as well. Unfortunately, what I haven't spotted is lions. But that doesn't mean that they're not there, or not here. I've been looking all around. Andrew and I have been racking our brains, trying to remember what they look like in order to spot them under bushes. sign of them but I wouldn't be surprised if they've just moved off a little way from the carcass. Brent also said to me that it was under a weeping willow. Oh, not a weeping willow, sorry that would be very out of place. A weeping wattle tree. This is not a weeping wattle tree, this is a bush willow which makes me wonder whether we haven't just come across the initial site of the kill. It's part of the leg there but nothing else. Now I haven't seen any hyena tracks coming in so I assume that the lions, this, this really is now trying to put together the evidence. I assume that they've moved further into the bush. But I do know that most of the carcass was already finished by the time the sunrise safari was over. Obviously the lions decided that that little hawk part was not all that appetizing or worth scrapping over. Shame, and the lionesses always have to contend with big males who could quite happily consume a lamb buffalo. There's another one of those carcass flies. And near those dew claws that I was talking about, sitting around behind the hoof. And you can see, as we look at the little hoof, where the overlay happens. And when I have a moment, when I find you a nice buffalo track, have a look at the bottom, because it's not often we get to look at the bottom of buffalo's feet. And then we'll go and see how that translates into a track in the soil. It'd be quite fun to do. You can see the overlay and the overlap. And at the back, those prehistoric, or the evidence of prehistoric other toes that would have been part of the buffalo's ancestors. Now, I haven't done a thorough scouting for these lions, so I'm going to do another loop around this carcass area and the crime scene, see if I can find the perpetrators. In the meantime, Scott is still with Karula. Oh, excuse me. I was midway through a massive gulp of my ice-cold water, keeping me cool. While you've been with Detective Patterson, examining the buffalo carcass, we have repositioned, possibly not to the best spot to see Karula, 
scratching that head of hers. But we have got a slightly better view here of the diker and just a change of scenery. It appears like the ants in my pants have been fumigated by Joseph and Raisa. Thank you for calming me down and buying some more time at this leopard sighting. My suggestion to leave was not received very well and I'm more than happy to go with the flow. And Raisa, you actually brought up a very good point. I could at least wait until another vehicle comes here so that if something does happen, at least somebody can tell us and we can come rushing back. So that's the experience of Raisa, who knows what's going on on safari, and that's because they've tuned in and been involved on many a safari with many a guide that's come through Safari Live. So thank you, Raisa. And also thanks to Joseph, just for showing your excitement of being around this leopard. Raybo One, who's watching on YouTube. I haven't heard your name before, Raybo One, so nice to chat with you. And you're interested to know if there are any predators that will actually feed on the entire carcass of an animal. I know now with Jamie, you saw that the jawbones had been left behind, some of the hooves. Um, the answer is yes and no. Lion, leopard, wild dog, and hyena and cheetah probably will all completely finish off kills of young animals that are very soft. So young impala, young diker, even a young buffalo may fall into that category for some of the biggest, bigger predators. Excuse me. So yes, they will eat the hooves, the skull, the jaws, the teeth, just about everything, but on the smaller, softer kills. It'll be interesting to see what happens here, and there is a strong chance you'll consume this entire carcass from the tip of its nose all the way till the end of its tail. So um, th that's the case in this particular sighting, but, if, but if, if it was an adult diker, possibly she would leave the hooves and parts of the skull because it's just a bit too big and difficult for her bones, uh, her, her jaw to crush. Hyena, it's important to know, are probably, well, they are the strongest of the animals with regards to jawbone and crushing power with their teeth, and they will mince through a lot more of any carcass than lion, leopard, or wild dog or cheetah. So hyenas have got the biggest capability in that department, but all of them will feed on just about everything with the smaller animals. It'll be interesting to see what happens here. All right, Bo. But like I said earlier, we are going to have to put on our patient pants because I don't foresee anything happening between now and six. So I think the last hour will probably be the most productive in this sighting. Okay, well, we just got some great feedback through from Jamie. And what happened was, phew, it was probably about six months ago now. I'm not too sure. Maybe you guys will be able to remind us. but. I uh, took out Kirsty on tracking team. Now, Kirsty at that stage was an assistant producer uh, whose role is to watch the shows in Johannesburg. And we have got three APs at the moment who watch every single show and then critique the cameraman's performance, the presenter's performance, the directors get a little bit of slack. They don't get uh, critiqued. Why? I'm not too sure. Only kidding. Um, th then Kirsty, after Tara left, got promoted. So now Kirsty's a director. Anyway, when Kirsty was still uh, AP, before she has become the acclaimed director position, she came out with me and we headed tracking our tracking for Karula, the same, very same leopard. And we managed to find her on foot. And while we were literally calling Jamie in on the radio, she caught a steenbuck right in front of us, on foot. It was a first for me. And it was also a massive first for Kirsty because she obviously probably had never been on a bushwalk in her life. Next thing she knew, there was a leopard in front of her. 
And next thing, the leopard had a stand buck dangling out of its mouth. So an incredibly memorable morning for myself, as it was for Kirsty. There's the poor little diker. It is dead, so at least that's the good news. It suffered for at least an hour and 15 minutes this morning until we left the scene, and who knows how much longer after that. Anyway, Jamie confirmed that after she established that sighting of Karula with the Steenbuck, the only thing that Karula did not feed on was the jawbones. So she crushed everything else, the hooves, the ears, a portion of the brain, but just the jaw was left behind. So thanks for that, Jamie. And how's this for interesting, to compare the same leopard in different states of hunger? That Steenbuck was not a baby as far as I'm aware. Maybe it could have been a youngster. Um, anyway, it's another small antelope, similarly sized to a diker, but she ate that entire Steenbuck in one sitting immediately after catching it and then left the scene. Now, this morning, she's caught a diker didn't kill it until sometime during the course of the day, unless it died on its own, and she still hasn't touched it. So it just goes to show how the same scenario can play out hugely differently depending on the different variables at hand. So something important to remember when asking us questions here, obviously we will always do our best to try and hypothesize with you and, and answer the various questions, but to answer some questions accurately are merely impossible because the behavior of these animals will change from one day to the next, depending on, like I say, so many different variables. The weather, their current mood, their current state of hunger. So, good lesson to be learned there. Hello to Noel Morris, another new name and another new viewer. It's great to have you with us. And even Karula's put up her head to greet you. Noel would like to know what is my favorite animal? And Noel, it's such a tricky question to answer. It depends on my mood on the day. Um, but leopards are one of my, my favorites, definitely. Um, for a couple of reasons, their, their beauty is incredible. Um, but more than that, just their interesting way of life, the fact that they are solitary. I hate being alone, so I admire the fact that they can spend so much time alone. It's not one of my strengths. I always need to be around people, otherwise I get lonely. Um, but the art of tracking is one of my favorite things to do out here, Noel. And tracking down a leopard is one of the hardest animals to track. So naturally, the harder the challenge becomes, the more joy uh, is felt at the end of a challenge. And especially this one, she is a nightmare to track down. She zigzags and crisscrosses, doesn't stick to the roads, which are the easiest places for us to track them on, and is generally just tough to find. So. I guess that's what makes leopards one of my favorite animals for a few reasons, but I guess one of the main trump cards is, is this, the, this tracking exercise. Obviously, a pride of lion is far easier to track down than an individual leopard. Leopards are always solitary, unless, of course, they're mating or they've got cubs. So most of the time, you've only got one set of tracks to follow. Their footprints are half as big as a lion's. So there's another a reason why it's harder to track them down. And obviously lions are more often than not in prides and not traveling alone. So I guess the complexities of tracking them down and the joy uh, that you feel when you do get lucky and do actually find one probably makes these animals one of my favorites. Then again, you know, an animal like an elephant would probably be one of my favorite animals. If I could choose one animal to view in general, it would be elephants. Because unlike Karula now, elephants don't sleep for hours on end, or at least not at the times of day when we like to view them. So there's an example of another animal that's got its own benefits and its own useful, I mean, um, amongst a million other things. Anyway, it's one of my favorites, Noel, and it's going to be interesting to know what your favorite animal is or what your favorite animal becomes as you join in to the Safari Life family.
interesting way of thinking has just been brought to our attention from Safari Dean. And you would like to know if this female leopard is possibly trying to lure in a male by having this kill on the ground here, or possibly a post-coital snack ready for him. I think it's highly, highly unlikely that that's the case, Safari Dean. She would be reluctant to share any, any of her kills with male leopards, be it her sons that are now too old to be stealing from her, or even her possible mates like Tingana or Mvula. Obviously, she doesn't have a say in the matter because she's a lot smaller than them. But if she wanted to mate, she would not be here feeding on this kill. She would be on the move seeking out the males. And that's the best way to, to get a mate. It's to find him and then to seduce him. And in the leopard world, it requires a lot of <clears throat> what is called lordosis. It's effectively the leopard equivalent of a lap dance that they need to perform to arouse the males. And this little baby diker isn't going to turn on Tingana as much as that sultry dance of hers. And usually what's interesting, Safari Dean, one last thing on that matter is that when leopards are mating, and it can be for three to five days, they will generally not feed during that uh, period or not be hugely focused on trying to find a meal. In one occasion, I remember finding um, a mating pair of leopards with a diker kill, an adult diker kill, but that diker was obviously incredibly un unlucky and must have just run straight into them while they were resting between matings. So it's usually not high up on the agenda, agenda post-coital snacks, as you suggested. <laughs> So, two questions that are interlinked. One is from Sharon, wondering whether or not Karula will possibly hoist the Stiker kill up into a tree later. And the second one from Sandy, a follow-on question, wondering where is the closest tree? Now, as VM zooms out, there is a knobthorn tree. Oh, there it is, growing out of this termite mound. This would not be a good option. You can see how many low-lying branches are here that you'd get tangled in trying to get up there. So unless lions came onto the scene and she was incredibly desperate, she probably wouldn't use this tree. To our right, there's a slightly better one. You can see there's less obstruction in the bottom section, so she'll, it'll be a little bit easier for her to climb up. But again, knobthorn trees are not their favorites. Then, if I can ask them just to pan all the way around to my side, I'm guessing, if anything, the maruna tree across there is the closest tree of a decent size. Nikki has just commented that she likes that tree, so she's directing us from the final control room, for those of you who are new. And yeah, that's probably the best tree that is closest. Now, sorry to ruin your hopes and dreams of seeing a leopard up a tree, but Sharon, I do not think that she will carry on or carry and hoist this diker up into a tree. I just think it's too small of a kill to warrant doing that at the moment. Unless, of course, hyena come into, onto the scene or any other predators that may try and steal it. So that would be the only re uh, reason or scenario 
when we would see her taking this kill up into a tree. Some of the bigger kills, they like to get up into a tree before that happens because they know that it's more complicated to get a big impala up into the tree. But this Daika, she'll pick up and run up a tree as if she's not even carrying anything with her. So it'll be very, very easy, and that's why she'll be reluctant to do it before she needs to because it's far more comfortable to feed on a Daika on the ground as opposed to up in a tree. Good. Well, let's show you one last look of... Karula. And Noel, thank you very, very much for letting us know what your favorite animal is. The flamingo. Now, I really wasn't expecting that, but it is an awesome animal. And I actually had some great sightings of flamingo just on leave now in the Western Cape of South Africa. And we need to apologize for you in advance because we don't see flamingos here in the Saabi sands. So, like I've said to a lot of our other viewers, Noel, we need to keep spreading the word about Safari Live. And the more places, or well, the more people that join in on these safaris, the more places we'll be able to take you to. Hopefully one of which will have flamingos. I know up in Kenya and the Rift Valleys that run through Kenya and Tanzania, there's some incredible flamingo viewing in the soda lakes there but not so much here where we are in the Sabi sands of South Africa. Thanks for letting us know, Noel, and we are going to send you across to Jamie to see how her lion hunting is coming along. Detective Jamie and her plucky sidekick, junior detective Andrew Francis, were hot on the tracks of the perpetrators. Oh, my word, who knew that was such a difficult word to say? Um, they fled the crime scene, leaving, making one mistake and leaving their footprints, leading us straight to their hiding place beneath a knob thorn tree. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. The three Nkuhuma lionesses resting in the shade in what looks like the most uncomfortable spot they could possibly have picked, but obviously was the only shade they could find. Speaking from experience, having made the mistake once, and I promise you, you only make that mistake once of walking beneath a knob thorn tree without shoes on, you get to experience firsthand just how many little twigs they drop with thorns sticking out of them. They can't be terribly comfortable, but they are very, very full and very warm. Now, I know that Brent touched upon the fact that he was a bit worried they were going to cross out for this afternoon's drive because there was no water here. Now, just to give you an idea, we have tracked them straight to Buffles Hook Dam. Now, I don't know whether that was because they didn't know that there was no water there. Maybe they didn't realize because they haven't been across to the side in so long. And as you can see, we're at our standard Buffles Hook Dam area. There's no water for them here to drink. Bless you. <laughs> Big sneeze. Did you get a knob thorn up your nose? Hello, ladies. It is so nice to see you. What a wonderful surprise. Carefully, carefully lying down on the thorns. Very sleepy lions panting heavily to try and undo the heat of the digestive processes oh that's interesting thank you for that information apparently one of these in Kuhuma lionesses is the female that was the first to be seen mating with the Birmingham boys after the takeover. Um, <laughs> it's the one using her sister as a leg rest. No girls. That female on the right there with two dark spots apparently was the one that was first seen mating with the Birmingham boys. The first two, as it were, broke her something of a peace deal between the Nkuhuma pride and and the Birmingham boys. Now, if I remember correctly, it was these two that were off on their own as well, on the buffalo kill a couple of weeks later. I could be wrong. 
I, it's very difficult for me to ID straight without comparison pictures, but I think it might be the two, these two females. And they have always shown a tendency to be exceptionally close to each other. We watched them after they fled the Birmingham boys, sit and groom each other for ages on Arethusa, really bonding with each other. And in this case, as you can see, using each other as a leg pillow. Hey girls, it is nice to see you again. And we have some interesting news. Donald Trump appears to be watching this afternoon. Donald would like to know where the mail went. Well, welcome, Donald. We are very happy to have you on the show. The mail crossed just to the east of us into a neighboring property named Torchwood. It is outside of our Travis area. And therefore outside of our jurisdiction as bush detectives. And he's gone to go and have a drink and quite possibly even reunite with the rest of the members of the Birmingham boys. Oh, and this is some awesome opportunities for screenshots of any identifying marks that you find on these lionesses. covered in burrs. I'm fairly certain, I actually haven't seen her open her eyes though, this, this is one of the older females. I could be wrong, I'd have to see her properly. But it, there's a scar on her head, I think it might be amber eyes. Now we've only got three lionesses here, which means that we're missing two other members of the Nkuhuma Pride, if I've got, oh sorry, three other members of the Nkuhuma Pride. Two lionesses and Junior, of course. And he's kind of been moving in and about with the Nkuhuma Pride. So he is seen with them and then he moves off on his own and then he comes back again. And Sandy, and I'm sure many others, you were wondering whether or not Junior was anywhere in the vicinity of this kill. Not that we know of, we didn't hear anything about it. It's highly likely that where the Birmingham males are spending time with the Nkuhuma Pride, Junior's gonna make himself scarce. Now, it's interesting the way that those dynamics have played out because when the Birmingham first, or the Birmingham's first started really harassing the Nkuhumas, there was one sighting that Steph had where he said that Junior went and lay about 100 meters away from the Birmingham boys and just watched them. And we chatted a lot about it and we, we sort of came to the conclusion that they'd obviously encountered them before and probably Junior adopted a very submissive approach. But that was close to eight months ago. He is now eight months older. He's approaching the age where really he should be off on his own. And I think it's likely that we should expect, we should expect him to move off and quite possibly move very far away from this area as he is now a potential threat to the Birmingham boys. I think you'll find that they will be less tolerant of his presence, particularly now that they are mating on a regular basis with his mother and with his sisters and his aunts. I think it's highly, highly likely that we're going to be seeing less and less of him. But he was seen with the Inkahuma Pride about 10 days ago or so, close to the Kruger boundary. <laughs> and Sleepy One, who's watching in Ohio. Sleepy One obviously feeling a kindred spirit within the lions. And Sleepy One, you were wondering how many hours a day lions will generally spend asleep. And the answer is close on 20 to 22 hours a day. Um, they are fierce predators with incredible metabolisms. But what that does mean is that they are fairly easily exhausted and they overheat very easily. So especially after big meals, they tend to try and sleep them off. And they've moved away from that kill 
partly because it's all gone. There's not much left for them to munch on. And also because since there are three lionesses on their own, I think they just decided that it was better for them to move away and not have to compete or run the risk of encountering any of our famous Juma hyenas. But they will spend, and it could, it's most likely that they will spend the next few hours sleeping until it gets a little bit cooler, at which point I would not be surprised at all that if they get up and start moving to look for water. The question will be, will they go west towards the Juma Pan? Will they go north into Buffleshook or will they go east into Torchwood? And only they will know. And the other question, of course, is where are the other two lionesses? Well, they are perfectly relaxed with fairly round bellies. I wouldn't say it's the... <laughs> it puts hilarious. <laughs> Imagine how hot they're making each other. I'm getting warm just looking at them. All that body heat being shared. As we watch those panting bellies, it's hard to imagine that they'll be hungry at any time soon. But as I said, those digestive processes within these predators work exceptionally fast. So in the next two or three days, they will need to kill and eat again. And Iggy, Iggy Tesla, you were wondering when next they're going to have to have their next meal. Two to three days is a good guess. At the moment, the lions are riding high. They have retreated to the core parts of their home ranges and are essentially sitting around dams or following buffalo herds and feeding themselves on all of the new calves or the sub-adult calves that are straggling at the back. Uh, I've said two to three days, but if they decide to get up and move sometime tonight and a, they happen to encounter a possible meal, it doesn't mean that they won't try and hunt it. So lions are opportunists, much like how with Karula and her Dacre, she doesn't seem to be starving right now but she's taken the opportunity to make a kill to save herself the risk of losing one at a later stage. As to why our vulture friend, who actually was the first thing we saw when we approached this lion sighting, embarrassingly enough, I think Andrew and myself are out of practice. I don't know why he's with them. I don't know if he was, it's a hooded vulture. So you see that narrow, thin beak that makes him essentially the toothpick of the vulture world, picking up on the scraps. That would explain why most of that buffalo carcass had been cleaned away around the joints and around the exposed patches of skin. I don't know why he's decided, I don't know if it's just a coincidence, that he happened to join these lionesses here. It's been a long time since I've seen the Unkuhuma Pride, and I'm really, really enjoying to be just being able to see them and get a bit of an update on their health. Hopefully at some point, we might even, as the day gets a little bit later, see the other two members, or at least the other two lionesses, come and join them. You never know, anything could happen. But Michael Fleetwood, who is watching the sun set safari, you were wondering whether or not this is the pride with the lioness with the missing tail. Bless you, Andrew. Have you got whatever the lions have got up their noses? Or are you allergic to cats? We are sitting straight downwind. <laughs> um, sorry, where was I? Oh, yes. Is this the pride with the tailless lioness? Michael, no. Um, the pride that you're thinking of with the lioness without a tail is called the Salala pride. And interestingly enough, apparently, <laughs> oh, just a gentle head rub there. <laughs> That's sweet. Um, apparently, her mother was tailless as well in the Salala pride. So the Inkumas and the Salalas are separated by quite an extensive difference. So we see the Salalas coming up around 
the southern end of Arethusa, sometimes onto Juma, but not very frequently. And their territory is more around Londolozi. And now that things have settled down with the Matimba males that moved down there and caused a little bit of havoc, they seem to be spending more time in that general area. Now we're sitting in the northeastern corner of Juma. Juma is part of the core part of the Inkuhuma's range, although I would say Buffleshook, Torchwood and Kruger are really their central areas from what we've seen. But the Inkuhumas and the Salalas are not in any way, to the best of my knowledge, connected. And the Inkuhuma pride came wandering in one day from Kruger, apparently, and is named the Inkuhuma pride because they were found under a large brown ivory tree. And that is the local name for a brown ivory tree, Inkuhuma. So just a bit of a history as to this particular pride's name. At the beginning of last year, nine individuals strong the birmingham boys have unfortunately severely reduced their numbers to five remaining lionesses and the male junior who as i said have, has probably wandered off because they fly yep that looks like amber eyes to me <laughs> fly fly in my eye i know the feeling girl luckily for us the lions seem to be attracting them all And yes, Gracie, Gracie, who is our eight-year-old viewer, you were saying that the lionesses have bugs in their eyes and doesn't that bother them? And it does bother them. That's why that one lioness moved to wipe her face with her paw. And that's why you get the ears twitching as well. And occasionally they sit up. <laughs> Luckily, they've got a sister to help keep the flies at bay. <laughs> lifting up her paw to rest it on her sister's face. Well, our lions are perfectly at peace and not rushing off anytime soon. So let's pop over and find out how Scott's doing with his cat. So I've got distracted um, and we've come in search of some chameleons. Now, interestingly enough, while we were sitting with Kula this morning, Ephraim, one of the guys from Cheetah Plains, spotted two chameleons in the tree that's right behind me here, and they were mating. And we've been searching, scanning, and couldn't find anything in this tree. And thanks, James Richard, your query as to what we thought may be going on with the chameleon lovers from this morning urged me to come and have a look at what was going on but sadly didn't find anything in this tree but what we can do is we can take a closer look around us maybe we'll get lucky maybe they've moved i mean there is a chance they do move they don't stay in set trees and why don't we start on this tree here this tree is a nice close one it's good cover similar to tree similar tree to what the chameleon chameleons plural were in earlier now obviously you're gonna have to really focus and squint your eyes they're incredibly well camouflaged and obviously can change the color of their skin depending on the surroundings they're in and i'm not sure if you guys can see anything there <laughs> and we were just playing we knew he was here can you believe it? Hello. And I'm not certain if this is one of the two from this morning. Look at those awesome little toes. Two on each side. Perfect for clambering around sticks and branches where they live. And I'm guessing that this could possibly be the male. There's no guarantees that it is, but the male was also a far darker shade than the female this morning. And I'm wondering if the female's not hidden from us somewhere and that this male's not trying to pursue her. She may well have been on the run from him today. From the reactions we saw this morning, we're not entirely convinced that the female chameleon had given this male consent to mount her. 
because immediately as she managed to wiggle free of his grasp, she turned around and started biting at his head and actually dislodged the little chameleon from the tree, or the male chameleon, which is smaller than the female. And that clip is on our Safari Live Facebook page, if you'd like to have a look at it. Now, it could be an entirely different chameleon, but I'm fairly certain that this is at least one of the two from this morning. points just been raised by Steph regarding the range of colors that these animals can change to. Usually they are green in coloration in this area because they're typically in green trees. Now Steph has just mentioned that sometimes they can go black if they are highly stressed or if they've been bitten by a snake. Steph, I've actually interestingly enough seen them going black first thing in the morning to, I guess, simulate being a black solar panel absorbing as much heat as possible being a cold-blooded animal that i was really impressed with so not only that steph but i've actually even noticed that they perfectly tilted their body and flattened their body creating the biggest possible solar panel angled at the perfect position to receive as much direct sunlight as possible that was up in kenya with a wonderful chameleon called the Jackson's three-horned chameleon, which is remarkably much like a triceratops in appearance. It's got three horns growing out of its head. Now, when chameleons move, not only will they rely on their camouflage, but they'll rely on this bobbing technique, slowly bobbing forward like this, and this simulates the movements of the tree. The little leaves, all the branches blowing in the wind, making it very difficult for, for predators to find them. Now, not only is this one trying to avoid being seen by predators, but it also looks like it's trying to find prey. And isn't it remarkable how they have this incredible ability to be able to move their eyes omnidirectionally? I mean, imagine you keeping one eye on your dinner and one eye on your kids behind you, wouldn't that be a great way for us to see the world? Quite complicated, obviously, because you need to have two panels in your brain that are receiving these two pictures. So a complex creature which this, with this wonderful adaptation and what I'm hoping to see. And we are going to have to all be in this together and have to be extra, super, super patient is that if we are patient enough, we may see the telescopic tongue of this flat-necked chameleon shooting out and catching some prey. And that's something that we can only hope for. But by investing some time with it, we could get lucky. And imagine seeing a chameleon catch an insect live on safari. I couldn't think of anything better, really. Now, one last thing regarding the interesting color changes of these animals is that if they get distressed, not only can they go black, as Steph just mentioned, but they have also got the ability to flare out a large flap of skin under their neck, or under their, their mouth, rather, sorry, and it becomes a bright orange coloration speckled with white. So they also have that little arsenal in their box of tricks. Now, as we hope in anticipation that it's going to catch some prey, what they will do to try and sync up the two different panels in their brain that are receiving the feeds from each eye individually, um, this is just my way of explaining it in layman's terms, um, what the, the chameleon does is it, it, it doesn't bob its head forwards and backwards like it does now as it's moving. It kind of does a sideways bobble. And I think what that sideways bobble does is it syncs those two screens or two viewfinders together, allowing it to calculate accurately where exactly that tongue 
needs to explode forward towards. And the tongue of a chameleon, this chameleon's probably, its body is probably about five inches long and its tail another five inches. So let's say it's about 10 inches in length. Its tongue will probably be able to reach out five inches. It'll probably be able to shoot out just as far as it's the length of its body. Obviously that's quite a way off. And like I said, there's a very certain movement that they do just before they shoot their tongue out. This is so cool. question that has just come through from Dia, who's interested to know whether or not they can move quickly, because they always appear to be on the go slow. And Dia, yes, they can move quite quickly. I've seen chameleons running across roads to try and evade being eaten by snakes. And look, it's not the world's fastest lizard-like reptile. But they certainly can move a lot faster than they choose to. Now, dear, the reason why they choose to move slowly is that that suits their incredible camouflage and it suits their, their technique of not being discovered. Look at that. I mean, hard to believe there's anything of vague interest on this bush ahead of us. But as we all know, there certainly is. And... Yeah, dear, so I think that should probably clear things up for you. The fact that it doesn't make sense for them to move quickly. It's far easier to detect an animal once it's highly mobile. Now, earlier on I was mentioning that these incredible eyes of the chameleon are not only looking for prey, but also for predators. And it sounds like we've got another new viewer, Minty. Haven't heard your refreshing name before. And it's good to have you with us. Minty, there is a large amount of various predators that will feed on chameleons. Snakes being a, a major one, especially a snake called the boom slung, which like chameleons, lives in trees and boom slung directly translated from one of our south african languages afrikaans means which is very similar to dutch minty means tree snake tree boom slung snake so that's the snake that i've seen consuming chameleons more than any other but maybe that's just been my luck or my history of these individuals I've also noticed birds feeding on chameleons. A lot of the time, hornbills are the culprits, and hornbills are one of my favorite birds, but when I see them flying off with a chameleon in their beak, I feel quite differently about them. As chameleons, you can't not love them. that's just come through from Shannon and I'm going to squeeze it in because it sounds like the lions may be beginning to stir. Shannon would like to know how many babies can chameleons have and interestingly Shannon there are different uh, types of chameleon with regards to how they either lay eggs or some actually give birth to live young. It's typically the dwarf chameleons that give birth to live young. These chameleons lay eggs and it's not many. I think it's from like between 8 and 12 eggs will be laid per clutch and it's at this time of the year that those eggs hatch so i think they mate now and the eggs will stay possibly for a whole year before hatching next summer i stand to be corrected but i've noticed a kind of the similar stage every year in the summer months you get these tiny little flap neck chameleons their whole body and tail is probably only an inch in length some of you may remember one from a morning not so long ago. We got lucky and found one. False alarm. The lions are no longer stirring and are now fast asleep again.
Hello, my good friend, Matty. And it is wonderful to know, as always, that you're watching. Now, for those of you who don't know Matty, he's just nine years old and has been joining us on these live safaris for quite some time now. So he's becoming a safari expert. Matty, I hope you are well. And like I said, it's so good to know that you are joining us again. Matty's asked a good question, and he would like to know if chameleons have the ability to be able to change color from birth, or is it something that they learn as they become older? And Matty, luckily, the chameleons are born with the brains and the ability to be able to change color from a very young age. And that's so important because at least we know that from birth that they know how to disappear and avoid being eaten by the hornbills, by the snakes, and by many other animals that will enjoy their soft flesh. Matty, we are now going to send you across to Jamie, and I hope you enjoy the lions, and let's hope it doesn't take too long before they get up and start showing you a good time. You never know, because it is nice and overcast, so there's a very good chance that at some point they will stand up and start to move. Well, the one lioness got a little bit tired of being cuddled by her sister. Uh, well, I think actually she just got really hot. Oh, look at that toe move. A little stretch there. Gives you such a cool idea of the flexibility of the foot. Look at the way those toes splay. You don't often get to see that unless they're climbing or scent marking or stretching their paws out of a tree. This is wonderful news. We have another new viewer. Now, Suresh, Dave, you're watching and you wanted to know if this is really live. Well, there you go, you have your proof. Yes, we really are live. This is happening in real time on Juma and Arethusa Game Reserves in the Sabi Sands of South Africa. We're sitting in real life with a pride of three lionesses. So please, if you have any questions that you want to ask about what's going on, if you feel like I'm talking a bit too much, like you know these lions already and you want me to explain a bit about their background, you are more than welcome to send through any questions or comments that you would like to ask. Even if you hear a bird calling in the background, you're more than welcome to ask me what it is. Welcome to our experience of Africa. I hope you enjoy it as much as many of our other regular viewers do. We bring you the most incredible stories. Let me tell you a bit about this for any new viewers as well as Suresh. So when I first started working on this reserve on, around July, the Inkuhuma Pride was thriving. They had eight healthy members, one male and then the rest females moving through this area, hunting buffalo. We got to actually see them catch a buffalo on live television, which you can imagine is the most, what is the word, intense feeling that you can have. But then everything changed. So they used to be ruled over by two dominant males known as the Matimba males that moved, worked around this area. And our male lions often work together in a group of two or more and they essentially control a territory. And within that territory, they have different sets of lion prides. So the Matimbas ruled over the Inkahumas, they ruled over the sticks, and then five young males came in from the north and challenged the Matimbas. The Matimbas actually didn't put up too much of a fight. They fled across to Londolozi and established themselves there, which is a bit to the southwest of where we're sitting now. And what that meant for the Inkahumas was now a period of serious transition and change. And very sadly, it was quite a violent transition. The Birmingham boys ended up killing one adult within the Pride and one of their sub-adult lionesses. So a lioness that was just coming up to about one and a half, two years old. And we're looking at the surviving members of the Pride. They're two missing from what I can tell. I'm sure they're around somewhere. It could be that one of them is even mating with the Birmingham boys as we speak. Peace has settled in. The Birmingham boys have become established and the Inkahumas are once again sitting with very full bellies, having munched on a buffalo this morning. And having 
told you that story about the lion pride that we're looking at at the moment. Orlando Riss, you wanted to know what the main threats are that could cause the death of a lion and what their sort of natural lifespan is in the wild. So the females that we're looking at at the moment, they actually live slightly longer than the males on average. We're talking about 13 or 14 years old, uh, the sort of the oldest lionesses. Probably you're looking at more of an average around 12 in this particular area. The males don't tend to live as long, usually around 10 or 11. And the reason behind that is they're faced with very different threats to the females. So a male, once he starts to hit about nine or 10, is past his prime. And at that point, one of the most common deaths for a lion or the common causes of death for a lion of that age, that is a male, is attack from younger males coming in and hoping to share their gene pool and produce offspring of their own. It's a way of keeping the genetic line of these lions nice and fresh and strong. It means that they don't have a chance to breed with their daughters or their granddaughters. A, a world that is for male lions, their biggest threat is another male lion. You want to know what the biggest threat to or biggest cause of lion death is? I have to give you the honest answer, but this answer doesn't apply to where we are here. Within South Africa, these beautiful cats are very well protected, but Africa in general, the biggest threat, as with probably the biggest threat to any animal species, is man, whether indirectly through loss of habitat or directly through poaching and hunting. That doesn't apply to where we are. We are so lucky to be in a wilderness area that is so well protected and actually bigger than some small countries, three million hectares worth of wilderness. And in terms of other threats, at before the age of about one year old, a threat to a lion cub would be something like a hyena. Even a leopard might try and kill a lion cub as a way of preventing competition as that lion cub gets older and preventing any kind of threat to them. For the lionesses, hyenas are a threat, but it's very unusual for them to kill an adult lioness. Usually the adult lioness will have a chance to run away if it is outnumbered. And probably the biggest threats are other lions or quite possibly an injury obtained during a hunt for buffalo. So one of their favorite foods out here is buffalo, especially with the larger prides because it gives them more food to share around between all of the lions because they can absolutely gorge themselves. And as we saw this morning, a buffalo calf weighing a couple of hundred kilograms made for a very short meal for three lionesses and an adult male. But buffalo do fight back, so lions do obtain injuries in the course of their hunts. Let's see the panty. You can, sorry, Andrew, can we go back for a second? Where you were there, yeah. Look at the thorns sticking on her chest. You can see what I mean when I said this seems like a funny place to go and lie down. Luckily, they've got that thick coat to protect them. Now, they are very hot and panting. And as I said, I, I wonder whether or not they didn't come to Buffleshook Dam in the hope that there would be water here. And Debbie, who is watching in Canada, you were wondering how water dependent are they? Obviously, we're sitting now at a really, really empty water hole. There's absolutely nothing here. There's not even any mud for them to maybe try and dig into and get some fresh water to come up to the surface. And Debbie, Debbie's watching in Canada, that's why I feel like there's a strong likelihood that they're going to get up and move. So usually they're going to try and drink once a day. They'll very often drink after a salty meal like a buffalo. So if they have access to water, they will drink as regularly as once a day or after a meal, possibly even more than once a day. If they're sitting on a big buffalo kill, they might move between a dam and the buffalo, backwards and forwards, which we've seen them do, for example, when they had a buffalo kill just further behind us, about 200 meters away from where we are now with that buffalo, back when Buffleshook Dam still had water. And they spent the day sort of casually getting up with very full bellies, going and having a drink and then coming back. Now, I think that there's a good chance that they will probably start moving at some point in the next few or the 
during the sunset safari. I really, really do. That being said, as without in areas without access to water, they can survive a little bit longer than without having to drink every day. So there are and there are lions that live within desert areas that are adapted, and there's even cases of them breaking open types of plants called summer melons to get moisture from them. If they can't get to a dam or a pumped water hole, then they'll break open a melon, it is essentially a melon, and drink up the liquid from there. So they have fascinating adaptations to the way that they live. At the moment, watching them pant and sit with those full, full bellies, I think that there is really a good chance that they're feeling very thirsty. It's very muggy today as well, quite a humid temperature. been watching for a fun-filled week and Nicole you definitely picked a good week to jump on board and I'm so glad that our lions have made an appearance from you so Nicole is watching all the way in California and you've just remarked because this is the first time you've had an opportunity to watch lions sleep and you have remarked on how surprised you are at how fast their breathing rate is and their heart rate seems to go and Nicole absolutely now this is something that you see when they're hot, but most often you will see them pant like this, particularly the, the lion at the back that looks like she swallowed a beach ball. You can see her lungs working furiously. Now this is very common to see when they've gorged themselves. So imagine they have now stuffed a huge amount of meat into their stomachs, which in turn pushes up against the lungs. So actually restricts their lung capacity a little bit. But more than that, that digestive process is happening so quickly and is producing huge amounts of heat. So while they're lying there digesting, they're actually feeling a little bit as though they're cooking themselves. And that's why they're panting and breathing as rapidly as they do. And that digestive process, because it works so fast, is actually quite demanding on their bodies. Something you will see, Nicole, as you watch with all of our predators. a bit about the fact that they are currently showing very little movement Ooh, except for as I said that the lioness who decided to change sides and roll over Wendy you were wondering since they spend so much time sleeping and not very much time moving about what are their metabolisms like and it's an interesting point I've said that their digestive process runs very quickly in terms of their metabolism, I think that they're also, they're very, very differently structured from humans. And I'm, I'm, I can't give you an exact answer, Wendy, because I don't know in answer to that. I don't think their metabolism, I think their metabolisms work very fast, very rapid digestion. But what's interesting about them is the way that they store energy within their muscles. And I can't explain it exactly because I don't fully know how it works, but I always thought I always imagined that predators like this would have rock hard muscles from the exercise that they do. And I always wondered about animals that maybe were in captivity that might lose fitness or condition, and whether or not there was a difference there. But their muscles are very, very different, these structured to ours. So I've felt anesthetized lions, I've touched anesthetized lions before during um, vet treatments and moving them around. They've got very, they almost feel flabby. But obviously they're not because they can go from sleeping like this to explosive power and speed, even with bellies like the ones that they have at the moment, in a, in a blink of an eye, faster than we could even think about reacting. And that lioness could cover if she wanted to, which would never happen, but if she wanted to, could cover the distance to this car in less than a second. It's about less it's about 10 meters or so which is about 30 feet 
if she wanted to, it would be faster than we could even think of reacting. A lion's top speed, when it's chasing after prey or charging, is somewhere in the region of 20 meters. 20 meters per second, that's 60 feet they cover per second. That is astronomically fast. So in terms of their metabolism, there must be some way that it's acting fast to help store up that elastic energy of those muscles and be on standby for when they need to use them. Now it's, we've often said that, um, or no, let me rephrase that. We haven't said this, but there is a perception that the male lion is hugely lazy and that all he does is let the females kill the prey items for him and then steals them away and munches on them and basically takes advantage of the females. But that's actually not the case at all. So the male lions, sorry guys, I'm just going to have a quick chat to Brent since he's asking. Oh, no, hold on, I think Scott might reply to him. Yeah, there we go. He's getting an update on the sightings. Right, what was I saying? Oh yes, male lions. So they actually expend far more energy because they're about 120 odd kilograms, so roughly 240, 250 pounds heavier than the females. And they've got that big thick mane around their necks. They actually overheat faster than the females do. So they tend not to participate in smaller hunts because they don't need to. They'd rather preserve their energy. They do step in, especially where bigger animals in, are involved. And of course, when there are no females around them and they're hungry, they're more than capable of hunting for themselves. But what they actually do is they spend far more time than the females covering huge distances when they want to. And they'll move easily 20 kilometers, so about 10 miles at night, easily. That's, a, that's on a short date, a short wonder. And they'll go and they'll spray urine and call. All of that is fairly energy demanding. So they're acting to protect the females from incursion from other males. And as such, that doesn't make them as lazy as their reputations make them out to be. Well, our lions though, having said they're not lazy, are now fast asleep still. Uh, we're gonna pop back over to Scott, see what he's up to, and I will catch up with you shortly. So, you'll notice that Karula has changed positions. She's trying to get comfortable. You'll also notice that there's a loud tapping noise coming from nearby. Tick, 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 tick. And that is a woodpecker looking for a meal. I just don't know which tree it's in. And it can be quite deceptive when trying to work out where they are. But I don't think it's too close to us. They typically like to look around dead trees or dead portions of trees, dead limbs, of which I can't see any nearby. But at least you'll be able to know what that tapping sound's coming from. Now for those of you who may have just joined the safari and not yet seen this leopard, it's also important that we point out behind her head is a baby diker that she caught this morning. We were with her when she did catch it, but we didn't see the actual takedown. It was through in quite thick bush, and she must have just stumbled upon this baby that couldn't hold its nerve and tried to flee at the last moments. And the leopard literally just did one pounce and latched onto it. The reason we know it was one pounce is we saw the kind of pounce and blur of movement through the thick bush and then Im immediately heard the bleating of this poor diker. And she's yet to feed on it. She was already full-bellied when she caught it, as she is now. You can see her panting heavily, not only from the heat, but from all of the meat pushing up against her diaphragm, causing her to take short breaths. Not dissimilar from the state that the lions are in over with Jamie. Well, Ed Petrapper, thank you so much for your kind words, saying that you think that this live safari is amazing. 
And if you think that after having just joined, then we're off to a great start and look forward to building a relationship with you in the future. You've, cho you've chosen a very good afternoon to, to join us because I can assure you we don't always have lions and leopards filling the screens. But there's a lot to look forward to and welcome to the family. And another new viewer, Stacy Hills in Canada, has asked a good question. And Stacy, you would like to know how much do we get involved with the animals? Do we ever catch them and maybe put a, a radio collar on them for monitoring their movements or monitoring their weight and growth over time? And no, Stacy, we have got a hands-off policy and we will very seldom, if ever, get involved with any of these wild animals. And we all believe very strongly about that here on Safari Live. Uh, humans' best role within an ecosystem is to be a spectator, and we try very much as, uh, as, as much as possible, wherever possible, to stick to that. We want to be here, getting an insight into their lives, but with very, very little interference uh, with that. Now, that's not to say that certain researchers and certain people uh, who have got the right qualifications and right knowledge to uh, kind of catch animals maybe in order to weigh them and monitor their growth and test them for various diseases. Um, those people, there is a place for those people out there, the researchers and the, the scientists and the professionals that can focus on, on, on finding out more of the intricacies with these animals. But for us, we just want to show you them living in their natural habitat, doing what they do on a daily basis with as little impact or interference as possible. So that's what we're all about. And Stacy, I hope all is well in Canada. It's great to have you with us. Trapper, very happy to hear that you have no need for the previous platform or channel that you used to use for entertainment because now you can merely join us live on these safaris and spread the word Ed Part Trapper. We're trying to get as many people involved in this operation as possible. We are already by far the largest safari vehicle on the planet and look forward to growing every day and the more we grow, the more fabulous destinations and animals we'll be able to show you. And another great comment's also just come through from another new viewer, and that's Brady Kelly. And you've just commented that, wow, this is amazing. And thank you, it is quite remarkable. And it's often easy for, at least I speak on behalf of myself, it's quite easy to forget how much brain power and foresight has gone into the safari live product and sadly the people who came up with the idea and who also have the brains behind getting this live picture to you are often those that are not really seen or heard of so it's important that we all take our hats off to our boss and founder graham as well as all the technical wizards that are slaving her away often tirelessly around the clock tweaking the tech st stuff that manages to get HD pictures to you in real time. So well done to them, and um, also just good to acknowledge their, their, their presence in our team. chatting a lot with our new viewers but it's important to understand for those new viewers that this product has been operational well varying degrees of uh, kind of how the, 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 the safari has transformed from many years ago when merely a 
JPEG picture was uploaded every 30 seconds to now getting a continual HD live stream. But Ellen Fowler is one of those viewers who has been joining these safaris for many, many years now. And Ellen, good to know you're watching as always. And you've asked a great question and one that I'm not entirely sure of, but I'm going to give you as much insight into the matter as I possibly can. And Ellen's pointed out that she was under the kind of impression that baby diker like this, this is a young diker, it's not fully grown, but it's almost about probably a, a third of how big it is going to be when fully grown. So not big at all. Um, it probably will stand about that high with its legs stopping about here and that would all be body. This individual is probably only about that big. Um, and what they do is the adults will leave them hidden in thick areas while they go off feeding. And Ellen said she thought that the parents would stay closer by these young that are hiding and not go off too far in search of food. And that may be applicable a lot of the time, Ellen, but it's very dry, we're in a drought, there's not nearly as much food around as possible. And maybe those parents, due to the harsh circumstances that we found ourselves in, have had to, they've had no other choice than to uh, kind of move further afield than normal from their youngster in search of food. So that's one aspect. On the other uh, kind of side of the coin, though, um, I know that throughout Africa, because these small diker have all adopted the same technique of, of hiding their young in certain areas while going off to feed, a lot of uh, young herd boys or, or local African people moving through kind of uh, wild areas like this where antelope roam free, maybe not all the big game, maybe not lion and leopard, but a lot of the time young African people will find baby dikers and think that they are doing a favor by picking it up and, and rescuing it and bringing it back to their homestead or bringing it to somebody to look after. So it happens quite regularly that these animals are found and there's no sign of their parents around. If anybody obviously saw that and saw the parents nearby, they'd put two and two together. But because they see the animal abandoned, they just assume that it has been abandoned, but it's not actually the case. And I think in these dry times and in, regu in, in, in general, the, the adults will move quite far in the knowledge and in the, the faith that by their youngster hiding, they shouldn't come into any trouble. So Ellen, I don't think the mother of this diker has been killed. I think it's too young to survive on its own. And I think its mother was just too far away to even hear its bleating call. So it could have been quite a long distance off. And that's another important thing to remember with this antelope is that when they bleat, their parents will often come racing back. And I'm not convinced that is why the leopard didn't kill the dike and did allow it to bleat for about 10 minutes after being caught. But there will be some guys that argue that the leopard was doing that on purpose. Good stuff. Great to know you're watching, Ellen. And we are going to send you from one sleepy cat to another. The awesome thing about this particular sighting and having this camera on the board with us, let me just turn Brent's voice down, is the fact that we get these incredible up close views. And just have a look at the plant, having chatted about how fast she's breathing, have a look at the plant in front of her nose. And you'll see how powerful those streams of air are that are coming out of her nostrils. She's actually blowing the plant fairly regularly. But it's such a nice view. It's not often that we get to, well, I mean, look at the beautiful face of the lioness for a start, but also look right up their nostrils. You really get an idea of how the shape of the nostril is perfected at drawing in air, not just from in front of them, I suppose, but also with that groove around the side as well. Something I've never thought about, I just thought I'd mention because I'm sitting observing it now. I've actually noticed that whilst we've been out with this wonderful camera, I've learned so much more about the little things that we see and the big things as well, because we get a really different perspective. I'm just sitting looking at her whiskers, thinking about how they play a role in the way that she operates and helps to guide her through. And if we can have a look at the stripe under her eye, something for new viewers that is fascinating. Underneath her eye, there is a lighter patch of fur that stands out really clearly and then is surrounded by the dark eyelashes. And that, the reason behind that is it helps to 
increase the ambient light at night. So essentially, like any white thing or any light-colored thing, it bounces light off it and helps to increase the amount that goes into the eye. You'll see it on Karula as well. If you have a look underneath her eye, you'll see there's a nice lighter patch of fur that does essentially the same thing. And that's because both lions and leopards are nocturnal predators. But if you have a look at the face of a cheetah, and we will, one day, we will have a, a cheetah wander through here and we'll get to have as close a look as we're looking at these lions now. Have a look at the darkness under the eye and the darkness around the cheeks and the nose. And that does the opposite. It helps to reduce glare, helps to absorb light because they're daytime hunters. You can see, you see it on every lion. now acting as a footrest for the other lioness who has very neatly and in a very dignified manner tucked her ankles, crossed her ankles, very ladylike. Just a pile of lionesses. And Anthony, you were wondering, first of all, Anthony, yes, you did get my name right. My name is Jamie. Welcome to the Sunset Safari. You, Anthony is watching in England and he would like to know what our biggest lion pride is that we have in the area and what their names are. Anthony, I just need to think about this for a moment. So probably closest to our area, the Inkahumas are the lionesses that we probably see the most, just as a, to start that off, and sitting at about six members. Further north in Buffelshook, there's also the Talamati pride, now, the Talamati Pride, I personally have never seen. They haven't wandered onto our Traverse area, but they do fall within this sort of general home range and they will fall under that area. They're controlled by the Salati males, and from what I understand, they number up to easily about 10, could well be more. I know they've got a couple of cubs with them as well. The Styx lionesses are a bit confusing because there's Styx breakaways and then there's two there's the two young females that move together and then the older females and the sub-adults. So I'm never quite sure exactly what the count of the Styx pride is. It seems to change on a fairly regular basis. The Salalas that we were chatting about before, that's a collection of six from what I understand. Six, um, we generally see five though. <laughs> Sorry, she's just... She's rolling over into the tree. That must be so uncomfortable. If we do leave these lionesses, I'm going to find a knobthorn tree and I'm going to show you exactly what I mean. Because I have encountered knobthorns before and it is not comfortable at all. But she's trying to roll away because I think she's too hot. She's trying to cool herself down by exposing her belly. Getting a bit of the breeze roll over it. Now initially, sorry Anthony, I will get back to your question in a moment. Initially, I expected them to be in the shade of Buffles Hook Drainage Line Dam itself. And then I realized that actually by being up on the crest here and under this knobthorn tree, they've made sure that there's a breeze blowing over them, which also I think helps to keep them cool. So Anthony, the Salalas that we see are five to six in number. Sometimes the adult female is missing. The Salala breakaways are a much larger, larger pride, but I've personally never seen them. And of course, lion prides can actually get huge in number. They can go well up to 40 or 50 individuals. And it depends on the area that you're in. go Gracie the flies were irritating her again but she's stretched out to touch paws with her sister and Rainbow one welcome to the sunset safari it's great that you are with us and still asking questions you wanted to know sort of roughly how large an area will a lion control and how often do they encounter each other 
Oh, there's a tangle of legs happening here. <laughs> Everybody's trying to get their leg on top because it's the coolest, it's the coolest spot. <laughs> it's like playing that game. I don't know if you guys ever played it as a child where you tried to get your hand on top of the pile. In hindsight, quite a lame game. But <laughs> now that I think about it, I haven't thought about that in years. And these lionesses seem to be enjoying it though. Now with her tail draped over her. But yes, I was asking, answering a question about lion territorial size. That depends on a couple of things. First of all, it depends on where you are in the world. It also depends on the lion density of the area. So first of all, what I'm going to say is that male territories and female territories are very distinct. So females don't try and keep males out of their territory. They often, their territories are smaller and fall within the male territory itself. They will only really defend their area if they encounter another female pride. And that generally doesn't happen. They actually avoid each other quite well. It does occasionally, they bump into each other. Let's say the Inkuhumas, let's take them for example. They've probably been involved in um, skirmishes and encounters with some of the other prides. In maybe it happens once or twice a year that we know of. Could happen more frequently, maybe once or twice a month. It's hard to say, of course, because we're not always with them. Their boundary will definitely be very close to the boundary of the Talamati pride, and I'm sure that the, those two prides have encountered each other. Female encounters, I want to say that they tend to be less aggressive, but it really is entirely dependent on circumstance. So roughly the Unkahumas area is all around Torchwood, it's around Juma and it's into Buffleshook and sometimes into Manuleti and even into Kruger. So that's an enormous area. That's probably about at least 5,000 hectares, so 5,000 soccer fields. And Lion Territory is actually, if it's easier for me to do it in kilometers squared, they can range anything from about 42 square kilometers in places with high density and with high prey density to 420 kilometers squared in some of the more sparse and open areas. So the area that we're in now, actually, and close to, or very close to where we are, the Satara area of Kruger, which this area is open to, and we're probably maybe about 50 kilometers away in a straight line, which is all part of the same wilderness area, wilderness park. That is the highest density of lions anywhere in the world, highest density of wild lions. So you're looking at big prides and you're looking at smallish territories, and that's because they've got lots of food available to hunt, and therefore it's an ideal habitat and they don't have to move as far. Male territories will always be bigger. And the important thing to remember, I always say this when I'm discussing territories, is that if that fly decides not to fly, I know exactly how the lion feels. Gracie, I'm doing the same thing she's doing when the flies try to fly up my nose. So don't think of a territory as a distinct puzzle piece with a set border that they never cross. It's quite a fluid, it's quite a fluid boundary so the Inkuhumas might stray into that edge of somebody else's territory because that lion pride is further away. If that, that, that was a terrible representation, I'd have to draw you a map, but I can't because there's lions there. But you get sort of roughly what I'm saying. Male territories are much, much bigger than female territories. So the Birmingham boys move all the way around Torchwood, Buffleshook, Juma, Arethusa, right down into Mala Mala, Chitwa, all of those surrounding areas which is probably about 10,000, easily 10,000 hectares that are under their control. So about double the size of the Unkahuma home range. Uh, it depends on the circumstances, it depends on the climatic conditions. And the difference between home ranges and territories, of course, is that the home range of the Unkahumas is very distinct from their territory that they defend. So the core part of their territory around Buffleshook and Torchwood, and maybe a little bit in Juma, as opposed to in the summer months where there's actual rain, where they have to move further and work harder to get hold of prey, that would be their enormous home range of 5,000 hectares. At the moment, they seem to be isolated to about half of that. Our vulture's still looking on. It's very common to see them perched in these striking silhouetted dead trees. They don't get caught in the vegetation. Now, 
just to give you a little bit of background on myself, I grew up as a child in the city of Johannesburg, feeling very much like I didn't enjoy being a city girl, but happy nonetheless. And Pamela, you were wondering if wild animals ever wander the streets of Johannesburg or any of the other big cities. And yes, absolutely they do. So the most, there was a big thing a couple of years ago in Johannesburg that there was a brown hyena photographed wandering through the streets. There was an uproar, it was in all of the newspapers and a whole load of researchers actually then piped up and said, guys, we've been studying these hyenas for years. They're dead in the big intersection, a big motorway intersection known as... What was that? Elephant. I think I heard an elephant. It was probably about 500 meters away from where we are now. Who was I? Train of thought. Oh yes, the brown hyena. Oh, sorry, Pamela. I will finish. I will finish my story and my description of animals moving through cities. But Karula is up and moving. A little bit of forefront for that tongue, eh? Oh yeah. Okay, now. Sorry, Jamie thought Karula was on the move, but it's not Karula. It's the chameleon, and you wouldn't believe it. But Brent and Alex, the Russian tech genius. Uh, just come and joined us in the sighting just to say hello and check in on us and we were busy chatting with them and looked back at the chameleon and saw it chewing on something so it made a kill we were sitting right next to us but we all missed it and all we saw was the chewing and what was interesting is we saw it racing up the branch to where it made the kill but didn't have the intimate understanding of these animals and didn't realize that it was actually racing towards some potential prey and it started doing the same really fast motion again. Here it goes again. And let's just make sure. Oh! Be careful. Nearly got blown off, off the bush. But you can see, not only is it in a big rush now, all of a sudden its tempo has definitely changed, but isn't it remarkable how differently colored it's become? Now it's the more typical color of a flat neck chameleon, green with those white stripes and a few white spots further up the flank. But you saw that quick movement, and it, I think, was certainly trying to get towards another potential prey. They'll feed on just about any insects. Now that it's calmed down, though, what I'd like to do is just ask VM to zoom out quickly, and we'd like to show you how far it's actually traveled since we last saw it. Now, for those of you who were with us earlier, you'll remember we were parked over there Okay, so looking to the right, battling to get into position. And it was up on this branch over here, but we were viewing it from the other side. From here, it managed to come all the way down and then along this bottom branch over here, it clambered across quite a big gap actually onto this branch all the way along here and then up into this bush, up into the central part of that bush, and then across, and then finally up, and then now it's here somewhere. Um, so it's been on the move. Unlike the sleepy lion and leopard that we are so lucky to have. Oh, look at the sunlight now. This is so cool. And fear not, we do have a great view of Karula. She's at our three o'clock. The chameleon's at our 10 o'clock. And she is fast asleep. So you're not missing anything from the leopard. And let's just try now, as best as possible, to be patient, because it'll be fascinating if we capture a kill. And James Richards, thank you right down the center of its chin. And those are all hundreds of tiny little spikes. What have you seen up there, Mr. Chameleon? I think that this is the male from this morning, but can't be certain. Uh, 
and what's great is is that it's I feel completely relaxed with our presence. Earlier on, you would have noticed how, as you try to get a little bit closer, it kind of turned away from us and thought about fleeing. But now it's got comfortable, and that's just what we want because we wanted to carry on hunting unaffected. And who knows, maybe, just maybe, we will get lucky. I've just heard a new radio voice come across, and that's a new guy called Mike from Cheetah Plains. So I was just going to help him with an update, but I was so busy updating you that Aubrey jumped ahead of me, so we'll leave Mike, who is on his first drive ever. So let's hope that goes well for him. Cheetah Plains has got some trainees at the moment. We're going to send you back to Jamie now. What a striking image this view is currently providing us with. Awesome to see. Our lines still making use of the shade, although I've noticed now that the sun is starting to poke through around the base of that tree, so I wouldn't be surprised if we start to see some movement soon. Now, I was in the middle of chatting about Pamela, Pamela's question before... I linked to Perula accidentally instead of a chameleon. But Pamela, we were chatting about animals moving through the streets and I mentioned the brown hyena of Johannesburg. There were a couple of recorded cases. There are lots of leopards apparently that move around the outskirts of Johannesburg and Pretoria. Occasionally, they enter into the city itself and they sometimes get found in the strangest of places like in drain pipes underneath stadiums and in old abandoned flats, blocks of flats or apartment buildings. And it does happen, it's less common in Johannesburg because Johannesburg doesn't have any surrounding wilderness areas. But for example, the residents of Palaboa, which is a big city within Limpopo and where one of the boundaries or one of the gates of the Kruger is situated, it is very common. For them there are pictures of lions walking past the petrol station elephants wandering down the road it does happen and they get captured and brought back to where they belong and then they usually try and find the hole in the fence and the fences are very good at fencing the animals in but if an animal wants to go they will go they will find a way and very often especially after floods it's common to find breaches in fences Throughout the rest of the, Afri uh, the African continent, I would say it's even more common, although the wildlife in those areas is dwindling at a slightly faster rate, especially towards Central and Northern Africa. But Botswana, Namibia, I'm sure you'll find recorded cases, Zambia, of lots of animals wandering through. The most common is hippo as well, because obviously you can't fence a river. So hippos like to go wandering during the evenings looking for different feeding opportunities. A lion walking down the streets of Johannesburg would be a bit of a surprise. turning into a really stunning afternoon. Now, Leanne, you've raised a really interesting question. Leanne wanted to know whether or not animals have different sleep levels in the same way that humans do. So we've got our sort of deep sleep, the um, ran, what's it, rapid eye movement, REM sleep, all of those different levels, that stage at which we dream, this point at which we're sort of going into half sleep. You're wondering if animals have different stages of sleep as well, or if I know. I don't know for certain. My guess would be yes. However, I think that there has to be a distinction between the way humans have now evolved to sleep and feeling fairly restful. I'm just sorry, I keep glancing off in that direction because there's a Franklin calling, but I think it's just doing its nocturnal or its sunset chorus. Leanne, if you think about it, 
humans have evolved now to the point where they can sleep comfortably in relative security that something's not going to hunt them or surprise them. For animals, all animals, including lions, they have to be constantly on alert, particularly more so for the, predator, uh, for the prey species. But I wonder whether there's not some kind of, maybe they have shorter stages of deep sleep that they go through. I know that deep sleep is really important in terms of repair for the body and the brain and the melatonin that it produces. Um, so I wonder whether or not they maybe just have slightly shorter periods. They definitely sleep for shorter periods before looking up again. That being said, I have seen Shadow so deeply asleep that a hyena nearly stepped on her before she heard it and realized and got up and dashed away. But her response from going from deep sleep to up and moving was incredibly rapid. Now, these lionesses, even though they've been sleeping pretty much the whole time, we've said that they're sleeping, they're not really asleep the whole time. They're constantly shifting around, moving every now and again, looking up and just checking that everything's okay. So Leanne, that was a very long way around of my saying, actually, I don't really know, but that's what I suspect is the case. I suspect they have slightly shorter periods of deep sleep. But from what I understand, deep sleep is really important in terms of the body's healing process. You can see ankles crossed again on the lioness using her as a wrist. I imagine that must actually be quite uncomfortable. I think if my belly were that full, I wouldn't want anybody's feet resting on my stomach. It's sort of post-Christmas full. Now there's a question I definitely know the answer to. Zoe, you were wondering whether or not I've ever seen the big cats eat grass. Um, you were saying that you know that domestic cats often do. Quite often I know it's associated in both dogs and cats when they're starting to feel a little bit upset or their stomach's a bit upset. And Zoe, yes, I've seen lions, leopards, cheetah, all of them, hyena actually as well, and wild dog. I've seen all of the big predators eat grass on occasion. I've also found where I watched a lion obviously had an upset stomach. In this particular case, I think it was because there was a shard of hoof that she'd consumed that got stuck and was making her feel uncomfortable and she went and ate a whole load of grass and then consequently vomited it up, including the shard of hoof that was blocking her. Oh yes, I've found grass in their scat before, I have found grass in their vomit before, and I've seen them actively eat grass. And sometimes they even seem to deliberately try and tickle the back of their throats with it. This really is the most amazing scene. There is nothing more striking than the silhouettes of African trees. They come with the most incredible shapes. And the clouds also making for a striking tableau. Now what I'm going to do is I want to actually try and see if we can get around these lines, maybe just change our pattern of where we've, what we've been looking at. I've been meaning to do it for a while, but I've been so caught up in the striking image we had. Oh, I need the immobilizer. Angie Byrne, who's watching in rainy England. I wish you could send some of it to us, please, Angie. Angie, you were saying that over Christmas you watched the documentary on a maned lioness with a deeper roar than the others. And you were wondering if this is something that is common or something that's been seen before. I know exactly, I've seen the articles as well on that particular lioness. Sorry, I'm just going to try and in a nice spot. Hello, girl. Here we go. I'm going to keep
keep my voice down a little bit more just because we're slightly closer than where we were before. And Angie, I did see those articles. Look at those beautiful eyes. Hello, girl. It's nice to see you again. Stunning. Very pale eyes for a lioness. Interesting color. Distracted by the gaze of this cat. See this black starting to develop around her nose. And all the little nicks and scars around her face that tell us the story of her life. Yes, you are beautiful with your eyeliner. And you can go that sort of the stages of sleep we were talking about, the sort of half dozing stage. Where was I? Oh yes, Angie's question about the main lioness. Now, I don't know if that has been recorded before. I certainly don't know of anyone who has seen them personally. I think it is very unusual. Now, I'd love to know exactly what it is within her biology that has led her to develop masculine characteristics like that. I wonder about the levels of testosterone she has. Maybe something similar to... Oh, it's just her tail flicking there. Maybe something similar to high levels or unusually high levels of testosterone. Sometimes you get girls or human females that are born not with ovaries but with testicles and it's gone something that's I can't remember exactly how it works but essentially hermaphroditic in biology I don't know if that's the same that applies to this lioness with the mane Angie I'm going to do some more research into it I'm going to ask the other presenters whether they've ever heard of it before up until this point I have seen the articles and I'm sure they have as well on that particular lioness you can see how when we look at her feet now, those little dark blotches, you're going to be kind and contract them for us. Not quite. Almost. And that's hidden within that furry fluff ball of a paw are five very deadly weapons. Claws that are tucked away in cartilage sheaths that help to protect them and keep them free from grime and dirt and allow them to be popped out by contractions of tendons within the leg itself and the wrist itself and exposed whenever the lioness wants extra traction or when she's gripping onto prey or even climbing trees which lionesses do sometimes do on the back foot there's four of them there you go you can have a look at the sole of the foot see if you can there's one two three four toes now if she would be so kind as to tilt her paw ever so slightly to the left. I, I don't know why I thought that was actually going to work. <laughs> we don't often get to look much like with that buffalo earlier. We don't really get to see the other side of a lion's paw. And what I really wanted to show you was the three lobes at the back of the paw. But unfortunately, the knob thorn is doing a fantastic job of hiding them away from us. Oh, another paw in the air. <laughs> so uncomfortable. There you go. Look at the back of the pad itself. Perfect. Thank you, girl. That was really convenient of you. Look at the back of the pad. And you'll see what we mean when we talk about... Oh, you've got another view. Ah, there we go. And see what we talk about when we mention the three lobes at the back. Oh, there we <laughs> Every time we get a view. <laughs> you girls are making our life difficult. Don't you know that we want to examine your foot structure? So yes, at the back of the pad, so that big pad that you're looking at, you'll see one, two, three lobes. Now that makes a really perfect impression in their track, and that's what tells you when you look at a track that it's a cat and not a dog or a hyena. In cat tracks, they have two lobes. In dogs or hyena, next time we get a nice view of the hyena's paws, remember to look for that. You'll be able to see only two lobes. 
I love looking at the structure of the way that these predators are built. And Joseph, you were saying, is that a foot the size of my hand? Yes, roughly it is. Probably even slightly bigger and definitely bigger if she were to spread it out or splay it in the way that they can. But you get a rough sort of idea, her paw. Maybe we can stop and have a look at the tracks. Now this time, it is not the chameleon that is moving. I believe it is Karula that is moving. So let's pop over to Scott once again. <laughs> well, isn't it hilarious that we are sharing a sighting of a leopard called Karula and a wonderful little chameleon who doesn't have a name. And understandably, Jamie thought the commotion earlier on was to rush across for the leopard. <clears throat> Finally, though, the leopard is up and she's moved only about a meter and a half from where she was lying. She was lying further to her right in the bush, and it is all further to her right where her dinner awaits her, the baby dyker. I was hoping she was going to get up and go straight towards it and start feeding on it, but it's a process, I guess, and this is, I guess you could say, early morning for her. She's been snoozing the whole day, as we would be the whole night. And it takes a little bit of a while to get into gear and get into full swing. And what we can expect to see in the next five minutes, ten minutes, I'm hoping, is a few big yawns from her. That's fairly typical behavior as a leopard wakes up, a bit of grooming is also likely and only then will she probably start thinking about feeding i'm hoping that jamie's theory about these lion is going to come true and i think it's a good theory that she's put forward to you guys and that is that because there's not much water nearby they may get moving earlier than normal Well, Viam and myself have been patiently waiting with the chameleon, who's still in and around, but difficult to see at the moment. He's on the other side of the bush to where we are, but we are going to keep an eye on it and make sure that we try as best as possible to get a live chameleon kill. That'll be a first, and something almost worth focusing on, I think, in the future. It's easy to find them at night with a spotlight. It's far easier than during the day, and what we could do is just return to that same tree the following day and really invest some time hoping to capture that shun tongue shooting out. Hello to Audrey, and haven't heard your name before, so thank you for joining in and thank you for sending through your question. And Audrey's interested to know whether or not this leopard is not scared of hyena, or if she's not put scared, possibly because she's already full-bellied. And Audrey, um, she will definitely be uh, scared of hyena, and she will know that the hyena could arrive at any moment. But because her hearing is so good and her smell is so good, and because she's had to run away from so many hyena over the 12 years she's been around, so she's the same age as you, Audrey, just about, she's about to turn 12, um, she knows what to do. And that's why she's not sitting here looking very panicked or looking like she is scared, but if anything was to happen, because she's so quick, because she's such a good climber, she will be able to escape and possibly even be able to take that little diker tonight's dinner with her up the tree. They are incredibly good climbers and also incredibly strong. So carrying that diker up into the tree won't be difficult at all. Good question though, and let's wait and see what happens at that, at that stage of the evening again. And I'm sure the hyena will be starting to get restless. And who knows, maybe there's one nearby that's going to come snooping through this area. 
Only time will tell, so don't go anywhere. Well, Elizabeth in the north of Scotland. You're interested to know if another animal may cause Karula a hard time and highly possible that if Wild Dog did come onto the scene, she would not try to put up a fight. Leopard give way immediately for Wild Dog. Um, even if it's only two or three of them I've seen, they will give way. I need to be careful though, because there's always different circumstances and variables. If wild dogs are running around through the bush, as they often do, and a few youngsters or possibly even adults may run past a big male leopard, that big male leopard may jump onto it and kill it, okay? That is very different to a big male leopard, the same male leopard that could kill a wild dog. He could be sleeping under a tree or lying down like Karula is right now, and a whole pack of wild dogs will not only get the sense of the leopard, but possibly also the sense of the kill, and come charging straight at that leopard, chasing it, knowing that it's there. Now, like I said, that's obviously a very different circumstance that the leopard is not going to want to be involved in. But, like I've just said, if a leopard's lying in wait and a wild dog runs, runs past, he may well ambush it. So, varying circumstances will cause for varying uh, kind of results and behavior from the various animals. But leopards, with kills, or even without, if wild dogs get a, a sense of them, they'll usually chase them collectively up into a tree. So that's a leopard's usual first move. But, on the flip side, leopards can and will kill wild dogs and sometimes take them up the tree with them. So I'll say 80% of the time the wild dog's gonna win, but 20% of the time leopards can strike back. Now, the behavior I was hoping for Karula to perform for us has yet to kick in, but this is the snooze. She's hit the snooze button and she's doing another 10 minute snooze before her next alarm goes off and then she'll wake up and start yawning and start grooming herself and only then possibly after another 10 minute snooze will she feed on the diker John, thank you for sending through your humorous comment asking whether or not Karula is still babysitting her baby diker. And yes, John, because it's the only baby that we know of her having, she's taking great care of it this afternoon. Um, and John from England, good to have you with us. A few Johns joining in the sunset safari and you've mentioned that her eyes are bigger than her belly and yes her eyes are as are all predators it is not uncommon for predators lions leopards cheetah wild dog all of them to kill as much as they can because they don't know when the next meal is going to be also interestingly john i mean i was chatting with steph this morning and He's had quite a few remarkable uh, uh, sightings with leopard where they will needlessly kill animals and discard them. So the, the, the process of, of stalking and pouncing and killing, which is so instinctive to these predators, it's essential that it's instinct to them. It's not something that's taught to them by their parents. It may be honed and additional training may be given to wild animals by their parents. But that instinctual desire to want to pounce and catch and kill is essential for them to succeed. And that is why you will occasionally see a big male leopard patrolling his territory and a dwarf mongoose might run past. And he'll pounce on it and catch it and kill it and in the same stride drop it out of his mouth and continue walking as if nothing's ever happened. So there is that side of predators. And we might not see it that often, but it certainly is there. And we can't shy away from that. Oh, is the next snooze, is the next alarm going off? Karula? Where's your alarm clock? Don't hit the snooze button. It's time to get up. Hmm. 
Mo. Another good question through from Charlene. And uh, apologies, Darlene, not Charlene, uh, in New Hampshire. Are you intrigued by the behavior of this leopardess from this morning? would like to know why is it that she would not kill the prey and let it suffer like that? And Darlene, I guess it's because the leopard doesn't necessarily know that it's suffering. I don't think, you know, that that's definitely a possibility. Um, I don't think leopards are necessarily malicious and get great joy out of seeing an, another animal suffer, but she knew that it couldn't go anywhere, and there was a speculation that I, I threw out there, and, and I think John or Josh may have put the, 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 the question through as well this morning, and, and that is that Daika are renowned for responding to bleating calls, and a lot of various tribes through Africa will hunt Daika by letting off that bleating squeal, and adult Daika will come to investigate. Now, whether Karula has got the wisdom to perform that, I am not convinced, but there is a small chance that prior experience has taught her that if that youngster keeps bleating and alarming, she may well be able to cash in on killing its mother as well. Again, though, I must re... re reinstate, no, that's the wrong word, but just confirm that I do not think that that is reiterates. There we go. That's the word. Thank you, Nikki. Um, I'd like to reiterate that I do not think that is the case, and I do not think the big cats are as clever as everybody gives them credit for. There's not as much science behind their stalking and teamwork as people make out to be, well, in the case of the lions. But that is just my opinion. We need to rush across to the lions. Toodle doo. And look at this. Look who's decided to wander onto the scene. Minus is keeping a very close eye on them. She's sat up. She's staring off. Now, originally, I think that was just because she heard the sound of them approaching and wanted to just try and figure out exactly what it was. The other two have stayed lying down. The, the elephants have come in and then realized that first of all, we're here. And second of all, I wouldn't be surprised if they've just got a whiff of those lions. I don't think they realize that the lions are here yet though. They're the girls. I think they actually stopped there because they were worried about us. Oh, it's a nice big herd. All coming out of the bushes. Now, it's not... It's not unheard of for elephants, and I've seen them do it regularly, for them to chase lions like this. They get very irritated with the lion's presence. Now, for the lions, that's not any kind of major threat. They know that they can outmaneuver the elephants but they did just want to make sure they kept an eye on what was going to pop out of the bushes. They could hear the elephants coming through. The elephants haven't spotted them yet. They've got quite a young calf, which might make them more protective. Generally though, they're content to move past the predators. However, what that does mean is I've got to make sure I've got a clear path behind me that I can reverse if needs be, because sometimes you get what's known as misplaced aggression, which is a fancy way of saying moving out, being in the wrong place in the middle of trouble. Luckily, we've got plenty of space to move backwards if we need to. And the lionesses are looking perfectly calm. They're lying down again. And the elephants, shame. I wonder if they haven't wandered across to Bufflesmook to see, like the lions did, whether or not there was any water here. Hello, Avies. You haven't seen the lions, eh? You haven't even noticed.
I mentioned that I don't particularly want to be caught in the middle of elephants wanting to get to the lions, but as it happens, they haven't noticed at all that there are lions next to us, only a couple of meters away. And Henry, who's watching in the UK, you wanted to know, what's that one doing? Sorry, what's that idiot doing there? You can't eat that. It's going to push it over. What you after that's under there? Very often under those dead branches, there's nice seed banks because it's slightly more protected and shaded. So there's fresher plant vegetation underneath it. And that's probably what that little elephant was doing. Sorry, but yes, I was going to answer Henry's question. Henry's watching in the UK. Welcome, Henry, to the Sunset Safari. I hope you are enjoying it as much as we are. You were wondering, when the presenters sit in close proximity to the cats, as we do, are we ever worried that they could jump into the vehicle? I'm going to answer that question in two parts. First of all, no. I'm never worried about them jumping into the vehicle. I wouldn't say that I'm worried. They are so habituated to the presence of vehicles. They've been viewed by tourists and by people in vehicles their entire lives and their mothers before them and their mother's mothers before that. Before that. So they've had 40 years worth of, oh, yawn, look at those fierce teeth. They've had 40 years worth of habituation to people. That being said, as we get a view of those fearsome weapons of this lioness, never ever take anything for granted. So they are wild animals, and whilst it is almost unheard of for them to jump into vehicles with people, I'm always very alert to watching their body language, and you never really sit in a sighting and not pay attention. Hello, girl. For example, exactly in the same way that I'm paying attention to what the elephant is doing. She's smelt them. She's smelt them and that's why she's showing that alert posture. Head up, trunk moving about. She cannot figure out where they are. So she's moving her head about. She's one of the matriarchs in charge of protecting the herd and keeping them safe. And Pam, surely, yes, in answer to your question, they can smell the lions. They are very much aware. Oh, sorry, Pam, you're wondering if I can smell the lions. No, not at the moment. Um, I could earlier. Lions do carry quite a distinctive smell at times. Here comes a big bull. Hello, beautiful boy. Yep, it's a boy. And he has come to harass the females. He's probably been following them, and that's the reason as well for their stress. Quite often this happens when a female's about to come into estrus. And what they're doing now is they're forming a perfect defensive strategy. This cow, this female that's on alert, she will have communicated her alert state to the rest of the herd. And I also think that they've been harassed by this male. Yeah, here comes one of the other large females. She will have communicated that. He is now pushing them, trying to... Essentially, what they do when the males harass like that is they push their way straight into the middle of the herd. Oh, irritated. She's so cross. And they go and they sniff and essentially just make themselves a nuisance. Sometimes they bully the calves, they push them out of the way. And that's why females with big males like this in attendance are sometimes a little bit more tense than normal. And so he's actually pushed and herded this entire group of them onto the Bufflesmith Dam wall. The lions are perfectly relaxed, but they are keeping an eye on what's happening in the sighting. They want to make sure that they don't get taken by surprise. They're all watching the elephants as they move. I think what I want to do, because you can see the alertness in their gaze, I actually want to reposition. Raisa? <laughs> Raisa, your prediction? You think that the lions are going to move in the next three minutes? Okay. I'll time you. We'll see if they leave in three minutes. I wouldn't actually be surprised. I think you 
are onto something. A couple of them are yawning, which is usually quite a good sign that they are planning on moving. Let's see though. Let us see. I'm gonna try and get the elephants and the lions in the same shot. that there's a possibility that the elephants could chase the lions. Sorry, Terry, I'm just trying to find a nice way through here without driving too close to the lions and upsetting them. There we go. That's all I wanted to do. Terry, you were wondering if the elephants do decide to come and chase the lions, will they fight back? And the answer is no. I think they pick their battles fairly carefully and they will sprint away as quickly as possible. Generally, elephants and lions, or lions certainly, do not want to tangle with elephants. They try to avoid them where at all possible. And that's because they're so much bigger and stronger. They're much slower than the lions. So the lions know that they could get away. <laughs> oh, you're falling off the damn wall, little one. Careful. Careful. Being jostled trying to make space. You've got to go walk one at a time, little ones. <coughs> Bless you, Andrew. Thank you. And a girl, girl, in response to Terry's question as well, you're stressing about the baby elephants and the lions. Please don't worry. It's very, very uncommon for elef or lions to even think about tackling the babies. The elephants are now moving away. The lions haven't shown any inclination of thinking about hunting them. And the reason, in fact, it's very unusual full stop for lions to hunt them. There are recorded cases, and some of you may have seen footage even, of lions tackling elephants in Botswana. That is usually at absolutely desperate times of the year when the drought has meant that the wildebeest and the buffalo, the, the lion's normal prey species, have actually moved off and they're left with only the herds of elephants in that area. And at that point, the prides then start to tackle the young bulls of the, on the outskirts of the herd. Rage Freak, you were also on the same wavelength. Apparently, Brent touched upon it as well, that lions have learned in certain areas to hunt elephants. Out here, they have absolutely no reason to risk it, and it is a very risky business. Interestingly, Brent and I were discussing this, and he is more familiar with those lion prides in that Botswana area. And he mentioned that in those particular prides, those lions, it was the females that had learned to hunt the elephants. And whenever new coalitions of males came in, they were initially terrified of the elephants before being taught by the lionesses how to hunt them, which is a fascinating, interesting insight into the social dynamics of the lions and the way that they hunt. Because of course, a male lion, if you're hunting an elephant, is a huge advantage. These females that we're looking at at the moment maybe sit with those big round bellies, Yes, you fatty. <laughs> With their big round bellies are probably at about 150 odd kilograms, close to 300 pounds. The male lion is not quite double that, but at least 100 kilograms more. So having their weight to hunt elephants is very much to their advantage. And then, as I said, they target the young males on the outskirts of the herd. They definitely tend not to go for the, although they could hunt younger calves, and it does happen. They tend to avoid them, and the reason they tend to avoid them is because the herd is actually more protective around its tiny little ones. So they tend to hunt the external, the sort of the outside forces. So if there's any kind of threat, and Michael, I know you were asking about the calves being hunted. Yes, a lion could take down a calf, no problem. It's about the size of a buffalo for them. But the rest of the herd is what they'd have to deal with, and the herd would form a defensive ring around them. The lions are now watching. 
like a bull walk across the dam wall. He's going to pop out nicely. Hello. You can see they're alert, but it's almost a sort of a curious look as to what's going on. So yes, the herd will form a very protective defensive structure around young calves. Whereas with the younger males who are at the point of being kicked out of their herd, ah, uh, you smelt them. Hello, boy. He's just going to shift around so that we could get the best position if he did decide to come and chase them. He definitely smelt them. But he hasn't quite decided what he's going to do about it. <laughs> oh, Raisa, shall I clap my hands a little bit and get the lions moving? <laughs> Your prediction wasn't quite. Oh, wow, look at that. Look how he's sinking in there. I wonder if he's going to dig for water. Now that would be so useful. I'm going to roll forward a little bit. Look how he's sinking. I was going to move forward, but I'm actually going to scare the, elef uh, the lions a bit if I do. Yeah, that's what he's after. He's after those water plants that have been growing, or those invasive species that have been growing in Buffles Hook Dam. He's right up to his elbow. Oh. <laughs> he struggles to negotiate around the mud. Brent apparently was able to walk right across Buffles Hook Dam. So you can see the enormous difference in weight in terms of Brent versus the male elephant. I mean, and Brent is not a small man, but he's definitely not quite 30-year-old elephant bull-sized. Look at this. This is amazing. What are you doing, boy? Careful. Don't get stuck now. This is so interesting. Oh, I really want to... I wonder if I can actually change position to get us around this log now. This is fascinating to watch. It's so, so cool. Sorry, girls. Lions are still there, by the way get to see a little bit better what that elephant bull is doing. <laughs> it's making such a squelchy vacuum noise. Awesome stuff. <laughs> and Cat Curdy, yes, he's using his trunk to help him here. Elephants really are amazing. He is so deep in that mud. What I think we should do is we should come back here tomorrow morning, depending on what happens, and just go and see how deep those holes are that he's just made. I bet they're close to mm, at least my waist height, if not my chest height in places. Oh. <laughs> there you go, dear. And Aria. <laughs> Dear and Ariel, there you go. He's made it out safely. Escaping the suction of the mud that was making incredible squelching sounds. So don't worry, he's made it out safely. Not unheard of for elephants to get stuck in mud or any other animal. Luckily in this case, he knew what he was doing. It's unusual, it's usually the youngsters that gets stuck. You can see how high that mud's gone though on his leg. Oh, he's back in again. <laughs> Sinking so deep down. He almost looks like he's feeling out with his trunk and sniffing the depth of the mud first. 
But I think what he's actually doing is looking for the plants that he can stretch out to. There you go. Got it, boy. Well done. <laughs> Stretched right out. Look at that. That full extension of the trunk. And Cat Curly, absolutely. You just never know what's going to happen next. Who would have thought we'd be ending our afternoon with the lions watching elephants? Oh, Raisa, you're coming close. I don't know which one to watch. <laughs> lions watching elephants sink into mud and stretch themselves out. Oh, frustrated shake of his head. He's not impressed. Raisa, your lions are licking their paws and yawning. The one is up. I think, what was that, maybe seven minutes? Close. And Darlene, watching this elephant wander into the mud, you were wondering whether it wouldn't make him more vulnerable to the lions. Yes and no. Yes, it certainly restricts his movement. Although I think with adrenaline he could move as fast as he needed to. But it... It's also the fact that he is such a large male that for the three lionesses, he is not a potential meal at all. He is still so powerful, capable of swinging his head, those tusks, that trunk, all of them are, that trunk probably weighs close to what I, or what the lionesses do. Lionesses are up, they are moving. Oh, what to choose? Too many things to choose from. Michael Fleetwood, just to finish off with our elephant in the mud, who is still in the mud, actually. You were wondering whether he might not be feeling for water with his trunk and with his feet. And yes, that is entirely possible. I think he could well be sniffing. He's still munching away at the plants, though, which seems to be his primary objective. And the lionesses are on the move. quick look at our elephant because he's just being so entertaining and Bethany from Austin you were wondering if the elephant the rest of the elephant's pride will wait for him and Bethany no his herd won't wait for him while he finishes eating and that's because he's not really part of the herd. The herd is only really females and their babies, and the males wander around either on their own or with other males before joining up with females that they might have an opportunity to mate with. Okay, he's done. And it gave us the perfect opportunity of not having to watch the lions reach the end of their buffalo meal. Oh, no, no, sorry. Not quite the end. Ah, you'll have to watch where we drive. They're putting landmines in the road for us. Now, let me tell you from past experience, you really, really, really do not want to drive through that. It stinks. There you go. Thanks, Andrew. <laughs> Andrew. <laughs> oh, it's... um first defecation post meal it's usually the smelliest and if you drive through it oh mm. oh. oh no <laughs> oh no <laughs> it's made by ice water oh, no. <laughs> it's terrible oh my gosh no don't stop there please keep walking please keep walking walking come on girl that's a good girl that's a good lioness Ooh. Oof. I promise you I'm not being melodramatic <laughs> uh, 
turn. The lions are wandering down the road. I'm going to get round in front of them. And while I do that, Karula has finally decided to start her meal. Well, I'm glad I'm not on the car with Jamie and Andrew after that last episode. And I can assure you there is no worse smell than the smell of a predator's dropping. Speaking of which, it looks like Karula is doing just the opposite. And she has just started plucking the fur off this baby diker. She's literally, literally just started. You haven't missed anything. You can see rigor mortis has set in as it would have long ago. As it doesn't take too long for a corpse to stiffen once it has died. And what I can assure you is that we've been here since before three o'clock and it was dead before we got you. So it'll be interesting to see where she takes it to now and why she wasn't happy to feed on it just there where she was plucking it. Maybe it's a little bit warm in that thicket. So there's only one way to find out what she's going to do and that's to follow her. So hold on. And whilst we loop ahead of her, we're going to send you back to the lion. We're still with our lionesses wandering down the road. They're making their way straight towards the boundary. I'm going to duck my head down so you can watch the way that she walks. Look at the way that she places her feet. Exactly, her back feet exactly where her front feet were. The stand and really relax. Walk. A way of walking silently in the most energy efficient way. They are walking straight towards the boundary. While we catch up with them and look for the perfect opportunity to loop around, let's go back to Karuda. Well, isn't it funny how both the sleepy predators decided to get up simultaneously, making Nikki's job in the final control room a little bit tricky? And isn't this fascinating to see? I mean, she is doing a great job of plucking this fur. But watch closely because there are often very awkward moments and you could imagine how that fur is going to stick to her tongue into the roof of her mouth and we are going to have the joy of watching her do this. <laughs> it is one of my favorite things to watch. I don't know why, but it is probably because you can relate to how unpleasant that must be, having a mouth full of hair and not having fingers like we do to pull it out. You've just got that tongue. Look at the claws now. That's awesome. Even the claws that are probably cl e easier to see are the ones on her right foot and look at how they are protruding from their sheets where they are protected when they're not needed kept sharp ready to climb trees and ready to pounce oh there she goes again sorry Karula that doesn't look like fun and you're getting a little bit of a moustache too not doing a great deal for your looks And of course, we mustn't forget that it is sad for this little diker, and this can be a little bit emotional for some of you, and apologies if it is tweaking your heartstrings, but we must remember that for this leopard to survive, it is critical that she catches and kills animals, and unfortunately for this baby diker, it was its turn to go. Well, she's going to try and pluck off as much fur as possible. It's not going to be completely bald in order for her to feed. She's just going to get off, like I say, the majority of the fur, and then she's going to start feeding in all likelihood from the rear forward. And she'll often start at the in and around the tail and work her way up the carcass from there. But let's see what she does. Sometimes they'll open up the stomach first in order to get to the organs but usually that's on the bigger animals like an impala on a small animal like this i'm guessing she's just going to start straight at the rump
what I was discussing with VM earlier, which will be interesting to see, is whether she's still here in the morning. Because it's a very small carcass. She could quite easily finish it in one sitting, but because she's already full bellied, only time will tell. So I'm hoping that she's still gonna be here in the morning because that means we get to see her again without having to try and track her down. And thanks for your comments, Zoe. And you just mentioned that you didn't realize the hardships that these big cats face with fur. And now I understand why it is that they get fur balls. Here she goes. Looks like she's got rid of enough fur for now, Zoe. Looks like she may well have just chewed off the tail there. Yeah. And listen carefully here. We're actually going to be able to hear her bone, her bone crunching jaws working their way through this carcass. And there's a lot of you that are seeing behavior that you've never seen before, never known of before. Sleepy One has just mentioned that they didn't realize that they actually plucked the fur off their prey. And it is interesting, they do do that. And they'll do the same with birds. They'll pluck the feathers off birds that they catch. Again, I think it'll be a good time now to just really listen carefully for a moment or two as we watch her feed. She just flatulated because I can smell her and it's not likely that we can smell the diker just yet. The stomach contents of the herbivores tend to smell bad, but I've just got a whiff of what smells like leopard fart. We're gonna send you across to the lions quickly and we're not going anywhere, so don't worry. Wandering their way towards the boundary. They're cutting a corner actually, they're not going straight towards Cheetah Cut Line as I thought they might. We managed to get into a position where we could actually reverse ahead of them. But they've stymied me by choosing a different path. Where are they on their way to? Something's attracted their attention. They've stopped all looking down the path. Now, just because they're full bellied doesn't mean that they won't take the opportunity for another hunt. She hasn't quite gone into stalk mode yet, but she's definitely on alert. I'll try and get ahead of them again, see what they're after. And while I do that, let's go back across to Scott and Marula. Well, she's making short work of this young and tender dike. And again, let's just listen carefully now. See how she uses those teeth set far back in her mouth to do the majority of the slicing and crunching. Almost like scissors. And I'm always incredibly surprised by their ability to slice through this flesh and hide and meat it's incredible incredibly more difficult than you think 
to process an animal like this. So we must really remember and give credit to the power of this animal and the ability of this animal to be able to feed on something like this. Okay, so it sounds like the lions may have spotted something. So there is a chance that you may get rushed very swiftly across to them. So exciting prospects there with the lions, but Jamie's going to keep Nikki in the final control, control room posted as to what she thinks should happen. And isn't it fascinating how? All afternoon we've been sitting waiting for these animals to wake up and simultaneously they start performing, trying to upstage one another. But for now, Karula is winning as she continues to feed on this little baby dyke. I'm not too sure what organ that looked to be there. It's a very small animal and she's going to be able to, like I said, work through it very quickly. and. It's time to join the lions and the hunts. I wish I was coming with you. Oh guys, this is extraordinary. There are water buck just in front of her. The water buck haven't realized that she's stalking them. I'm not sure where the other lionesses have gone. I think they've moved around to try and get there. There you can see one of the water buck. You can see it's looking towards us, and now it's looked back towards where she is. Now, I can't turn the vehicle on. I can't really reposition, because if I do, I could run the risk of disturbing this hunt. She's just disappeared behind this termite mound. But the water buck are walking towards the lions. They're perfect. The wind is perfect for this. It's blowing the water buck scent straight towards them. And that's how they figured out where they are. And oh, we can't, I can't see where the lioness has gone anymore, but we will definitely, definitely keep looking guys. See if you can spot the lion. I'm not sure where she is. We will definitely hear it if she decides to launch an attack. She was stalking fairly quickly. It's amazing at moments like this, your senses go on such high alert. I can't see the water buck either now. The suspense is brutal. Oh, it's such dense vegetation, she'll be able to sneak right up on them before she pounces. And as I said, the wind is perfect. I'm listening for any sounds of leaves being scuffed or plant being scuffed. frozen in anticipation. Uh, as you may well have noticed, we've already gone over time. So for those of you who can stay, please stay. There's a very, very good chance these lions could catch these water buck. We are going to extend drive until we know exactly what happens. Can't pass up an opportunity like this. Can't believe how quiet it's gone. Andrew's checking really thoroughly. 
behind all the plants and the bushes. On the water back, I can't see where they were going. Last I saw, they were moving straight towards the lions. They were about 40 meters in front of us over there. And they moved in a sort of a general direction like that into the vegetation. I can't see them with my own eyes. The camera also helps to, oh, is that a stick cracking? Wonder where those other lionesses went. chase like this, a stalk could last quite an extended period of time. So she wants to absolutely conserve her energy, or all three of them do, until right up at the right moment. Guys, we're gonna keep watching, but at the moment, since we don't have any visual, we're gonna send you back over to Karula. If anything changes, anything at all, we will crash cut straight back here. So enjoy for now, we'll keep you updated. So I was just on the radio with Jos, one of the landowners here, and he's back in town on holiday which is great he's a wonderful wonderful guy and he loves leopards so very happy that we've helped get his safari off to a great start and i just mentioned that as soon as we are finished we're gonna let him take our prime spot we're in quite thick bush here so there's only going to be a good spot for one vehicle she's now making her way through the ribs you can see the individual rib bones there And what a wonderful safari it's been, exciting stuff over on Jamie's vehicle. I wonder if those lion are gonna get lucky. And Leopard Gecko, you've just commented, oh my gosh, this is all so tense. And it is. And it's great that we can be sharing it with you. And thank you so much for tuning in. Huge welcome to all the new viewers. You've chosen a great safari to debut if this is your first one. We don't always get this lucky. But we look forward to getting to know all of you a lot better over the coming weeks and months. Indefinitely, really. As we continue on this live safari experience. Interesting question through from Lynn. Interested to know if lions or leopards will ever get sick from feeding on too much. And not that I've ever seen, but Lynn, they do become incredibly uncomfortable and eat themselves basically into a coma that they sleep through until they start their next feeding session. Lions on buffalo kills tend to be the worst when it comes to pigging out. Leopards, because they can hoist their kills up into trees and because they often are not competing with other animals, they're solitary, so they only have to deal with themselves, they can eat at a more leisurely speed so you don't see leopards rotund and as uncomfortable as full-bellied lion. So lion are probably the biggest of the bellies. And speaking of big lion bellies, it sounds like there are some swaggering down the road towards Jamie and you're about to join her. Here the lions come. A hunt that I think failed. I'm not entirely sure what happened with them. Splitting up around the vehicle. What an amazing experience this is for us. Try not to shine a spotlight directly at them. No girl. That 
is such an awesome feeling. You think, Andrew, a brief glance before moving behind us. How does that feel, Andrew? Do you ever get used to that? Oh, look at her. Such a cool feeling. And while I reposition as they head towards the boundary, Scott wants to say goodbye to you all. Well, she's just got to the hoof, an interesting part of the dikers anatomy, and even that she doesn't want to give up. She actually regurgitated it almost. She had tried to swallow it and then it obviously didn't go down too well. But now she's having a second crack at it, and that's a good example of just how nothing goes to waste. And a small carcass like this, they'll be able to crunch through just about everything other than the jaw bones. Okay, well, we're going to leave Karula to enjoy her snack. We'll certainly be returning here in the morning to see if she's finished it off or where she's headed. And it's been a wonderful, wonderful sunset safari. A huge thank you to joining, sending in all your questions and comments, and to all the new viewers, well done for finding us, and we look forward to getting to know you guys better in the future. VM, thanks for your great camera work. Nikki and Kirsty in the final control, as always, doing a great job. Back to Jamie. We'll see you all next time. an incredible way to end off our sunset safari and watching is three beautiful Nkuhuma lionesses slowly making their way calmly towards Torchwood. I'm not sure what happened with that hunt. I don't know if the water buck spooked them or why it was that they shifted away and abandoned the hunt. Maybe their hearts weren't all that in it because their bellies were full. Now, we leave them with the mystery of the night ahead of them. And then, just before we finish up, there's the boundary approaching. We get to watch these lionesses slowly walk away from us. Lynn, you were saying you've never seen anything hunt waterbuck. It's actually one of the favorite prey species of these lions. It's a nice size, particularly for three lionesses like this. It means that they're provided with plenty of food. What an awesome sight. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to say goodbye to you all as the lionesses approach the boundary. It has been a wonderful afternoon and I thank you all for your comments and your questions as well as to Andrew for his brilliant camera work. Thank you to the lovely ladies in FC as well as to Eugene. Have a fantastic day everyone. I'm going to leave you with a few moments to just watch the lions walk away.